Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign on the WeFunder platform. To learn more how to become an early investor and across the risk, go to https semicolon backslash backslash refunder.com slash Cabinets HR. Our guest today is Shannon Paulson. Shannon, you ready to be great today? I'm ready to be great. Shannon, starting off, talk about growing up in Alaska as a young girl. First of all, were you the only child or you had brothers and sisters? No, I was the eldest. I'm surprising nobody that knows me, but uh, yeah, I was the eldest of three. So what was it like growing up there? And was it in Anchorage, Fairbanks or some random remote? Yeah, I was. I grew up just on the outside of Anchorage, and um, and so the rest of Alaska doesn't consider that Alaska, of course. But um, but it was plenty of Alaska. So that's too city five. Yeah, too city five. <laughs> exactly. I think they call it the L A of uh, the L A of Alaska. So half the population is there. But um, no, I think it was. Uh, I'm really, really incredibly grateful for the opportunity to grow up so close to wilderness and really loving wilderness and uh, and having a sense too that we had to be able to take care of ourselves. I think that's something that everybody that grows up in Alaska really internalizes. So I guess even growing up in the LA of Alaska, you had no choice but be like an outdoorsy type person, right? Well, there's people that are are not, which, but I think Alaska would probably be sort of miserable if you weren't at least somewhat outdoorsy. But yeah, I, I was lucky. My dad took us out hiking through the mountains, through the Chugach, and um, we still spend quite a bit of time up at Denali now, which is a wonderful place that we ended up with a cabin uh, later in my life. So. so what are some fond memories growing up like in that type of lifestyle? Oh, yeah. Well, there's one I think I for me talk about this in a book. I can't remember actually if I've written this out or not, but I remember hiking up at Willowa Lakes and Willowa Lakes um, is behind Willowa Peaks in the Chugach Range just outside of Anchorage. And uh, and I remember that we were camping with our dog peaches and it was a, a little um, a golden retriever and her, her paws had been all cut up on the shale because it was probably six or eight miles back to where we camped and we had one of these McKinley tents that had a pole that went straight up and then kind of came down on each side and Willowa means wind in Alaska and so in the middle of the night and in the middle of the summer so it only was dark for a couple of hours the wind picked up and I remember in the middle of the night the pole that went straight up through the tent just ripped down and the tent was just flapping and shrieking like a bunch of banshees. It was totally terrifying actually. Um, and we ended up having to pack up in the middle of the night and then we were hiking out and then Peaches had her paws all cut on the shale of the Chugach, which is all shale rock. And my dad ended up putting the dog in his backpack and <laughs> it, it will be a, a camping trip that I remember forever. And you see you go back and visit regularly? We go back, usually in August, we spend the month of August at our cabin in Denali, typically. And is your family still up there? Uh, my, my father and stepmother died. That's um, the subject of my first book, North of Hope. And uh, my mother is still up there in Anchorage. So, okay. um, And we have a cabin that belonged to my father and stepmother that's up at Denali. So we uh, that's where we spend most of our time now. Okay. So before we go any further, I want to tell everyone how we met. So, you know, I have no concept of time anymore, but I think like a year ago, you spoke at a, at a conference at the Boeing Museum of Flight. Ah, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, okay. That, that my friend Carrie Jita put on and you, some other like outstanding female aviation yes. leaders did a talk, right? Can you talk about like how that came about? Like how do you met Carrie and like how the whole thing did? Because all y'all gave such wonderful speeches. Like, man, y'all did some amazing stuff back in the day and still do amazing day things, you know? Oh, I'm so glad. I'm, gl I'm glad you reminded me of that too. No, that was a fabulous panel. Carrie did an amazing job putting that together. Uh, I, you know, I don't even know how we all connected. I think we all do this kind of work and then we end up connecting online or on LinkedIn or on some other platform. Carrie was, and maybe still is representing Meryl Tengestall and her awesome book, um, Shatter the Sky. She was the first black woman U2 pilot. And uh, Eileen was there. And I think there was another woman that that died, that called in. But um, yeah, that was a fantastic panel. And it really has been a lot of fun because I don't remember the specifics of how I even met Carrie. But I think we just met online doing, doing the work that we're doing, which is really promoting leadership and women in leadership and speaking about uh, our experiences relative to that to be able to help companies also then bring up their leadership teams just as a successful. Yeah, it just amazing how all y'all like, like no one speech was way better than the other. You know, it was like the same love. Like, man, this is like outstanding. Like almost like y'all teamed up together. Like, don't outshine everyone. They want to like, do an A plus level speech, you know, like, you know, because all the good, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was a fabulous panel. I mean, just incredible. And Eileen Borkman is this incredibly, I mean, just unbelievable experience as an aviator and as an engineer. And so I, I think we all complimented each other really well in that yeah. uh, that panel. I don't think I really remember hitting me like, and it's, it's, you know, it's like it was kind of bad, but like the one lady, the retired colonel works in the Bay Area. Yeah. Told the story like at least once a month, someone asked her to go get like security passes and some bullshit like that. 
Right. Like, are you freaking kidding me right now? Like, <laughs> do you know who she is? <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know? yeah, are you yeah, kidding yeah. me right now? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like, no, that's common not. sense, you know. You think this lady's kind of, you know, she's not, you know, it's kind of older, you know, and you know, I'm sure she carries her personal matter. Like, this, can you get my passport for me? Like, and for her to have the patience to deal with that, like, I couldn't be me, right? She, she, I'll be flaming people, I think. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, and that happens all the time for women. Yeah. And it's, it's unfortunate, um, right? It is. It really is. I, I, and I think that is something that has been really evident to me over the years of of doing this work. Is you know, there's initially some reluctance because as military, we think of ourselves as a team. We don't think of ourselves as individuals. And women tend to not tell their stories, not share their stories as much. Mm -hmm. And realizing how important it is that we do share these stories and share the stories of others in uh, all of these incredible yeah. leaders, men and women, because at the end of the day, uh, we all need to contribute our best selves. But these stories aren't out there enough yeah. where people understand what everybody can contribute. And that's where it really becomes important. And then remember, I think the black lady's name is Meryl. I Meryl, think. yeah. yeah, yeah. For, for, so first time she said was like, I can tell you for a fact, the earth is not flat. I, I know for a fact, I've seen it with my own eyes, the earth is not flat. From a U2, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. No, she's fabulous. I, I absolutely love Meryl. She's been a, a great person to, to continue to develop a friendship with. So so what is, is there an actual community, like, you know, former aviation military females? Is there like a community out there somewhere, like on Facebook or LinkedIn, where you're like, her notes and stuff or something like there's that. There's not. I mean, it kind that's of a, it that's a good idea, wouldn't it? That's I, surprising. There's a group of, I think, Air Force and Navy fighter pilot women um, that I have heard about, but uh, but not for all of us. And I okay. guess, you know, we Army people, we always get left out, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I know. No, that's not true. I'm actually, I have actually loved meeting all of these these women in across the services, which again, I hadn't had a chance to meet when I was in. It was too early and there were a few of us scattered around, okay. but we weren't really connected. And there wasn't the internet, right? There yeah. wasn't that thing in the 90s. And so talking about networking a little bit, you know, like I, I, Carrie invited me to the the group thing. I met a lot of people like you and other people on the panel, right? Yeah. And this thing, you know, if I were to take the opportunity, to, if I say, hey, I got time for that BS, right? No word. And but I went and I met you on the podcast, you know, right? who's going to come from this, like all the different people you meet and stuff, you know, you just, you got to put yourself out there, right? You do, you do, you do have to put yourself out there, right? And that is, um, at the end of the day, you know, every person has gifts to contribute to this world and the world needs us all to give our best. And so the only way that the world knows that you're out there is if you get out there. Yeah. And that can be uncomfortable for a lot of us, but I think it's something that we either have to push to overcome or continue to overcome each day. So how do you convince or influence someone that, hey, you know, put yourself out there? I know you're scared or whatever. You don't want to, you yeah. think you're not good enough or whatever, but actually, you know, put yourself out there and just see what happens. I think you just, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's something each one of us has to do, right? Each one of us has to make that decision to do it. But um, if I'm talking to somebody, I'll just say, look, you, the, the world needs your gifts. The world needs you to be able to give your absolute best. And so if you hold back, the world doesn't get that, right? And we don't, we don't, collectively benefit from all it is that you have to give to the world. And so uh, I think that helps to kind of reframe it a little bit and say, we're contributing. We're all finding ways to contribute and to give our absolute best. And, and if that's the case, you got to put yourself out there so that you can give your best. But So you go up to Alaska, you decide to go to Duke. Yeah. Why Duke versus like Stanford <laughs> or Cal, all those, you know, fine institutions on the West Coast, even the middle of America, why Duke? I think um, also surprising nobody that knows me well. I wanted to get as far away from home as possible. Uh, I mean, that's understandable. You were like a 17, 18, 19 year old yeah, young lady, you know what I mean? That's get totally understandable. Out, yeah. Right. And I was, I was, you know, my parents were divorced. That was um, a really tough thing for me to, to, to deal with, although I tended to just not deal with it and do other things instead. But, um, but I, I just wanted to get out and to get away. Um, Duke ended up being uh, probably not the best cultural fit for me, um, but, but is probably one of the reasons that I ended up in ROTC and connecting to that community pretty well. Um, so I think at the end of the day, uh, as I look back over those different decisions, you start to see how those paths start to to build on each other, and uh, and I'm grateful for it. But it was it was as big of a culture shock as I have ever had in my life to go from Alaska. I saw for to your family. parents and other people, and you said I'm going to Duke. I'm pretty surprised. <laughs> I mean, I remember somebody saying just to show you kind of what the mindset was when I went in the '80s, and still is sometimes. Is like, oh well, you'll probably meet a a nice Southern boy, and and I was like. <laughs> What? I mean, that was like so much not in my mind at all. And um, so much not what I was inclined to do. Uh, but um, I, I'm grateful for the the challenge of of learning that new culture, which was again like it was a huge yeah. shift. And and since then, you know, subsequent 
cultural shifts have been easier because that was such a massive one. Now, how did this work? Like, I could be wrong about Duke because I kind of, like, of course, most colleges like really liberal. Isn't Duke like known as like a kind of liberal school? Or they known as a conservative school, or I think there's both. Um, because it's you know the south it's yeah. uh <laughs> so um uh, but but it's both and like all universities have an element of that do, for sure don't, don't i mean i'm making this up maybe but i always feel like a lot of like rich people from new in new york come down to do yes. because they can't get into the pen or something you know <laughs> So, oh, I give you so they got on a dip. That's not what he's telling me. Just the Alaskan. I, <laughs> that could be. There were certainly a lot of people from New Jersey. <laughs> that too, you know. And a lot of people from the South. I think, um, yeah, so there was that element. And I remember it was actually, because I grew up in Alaska where it's sort of, I, purple, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very purple. And we yeah. were probably a slightly more conservative family. Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of the libertarian sort of a thing. And it was also a different kind of conservatism than it is today. Yeah. I think that's also really important to pull out. But there was this sense of service that was really strong growing up. And I remember it was challenging because I went in 89, so 89 to 93, right, in the Gulf War starts and uh and i remember there were all these protests and i was in an rotc and you know they were like spray painting the vans yeah. like baby killers and yeah, stuff like that ask, how do that how do you work that you know the, the the philosophy of like being rtc versus a college you know like that would be like you know something to go through you know yeah no it was interesting i um probably i've never been particularly graceful in managing these things but i i uh <laughs> i'm slightly embarrassed to say this now but i do think both sides were just so not fully informed basically uh, on, on any campus really because it's just people with lots of passion and a little less information sometimes um, but there were these big protests that were happening my sophomore year right outside of my window on the west campus which is the main campus at duke and i remember i hung out <laughs> the american flag out my window and i played lee greenwood's god bless the usa <laughs> which i am now mortified to admit all of that <laughs> So you're, you're so you're trolling back in the day. You're trolling back in the day. I'm a little mortified to admit all of that, but you know I think we're all sorting ourselves out. And um, uh, oh man, I, like yeah. that's a bold move. Like you don't mess around me. You can coach it from my window. <laughs> I'm gonna put this back. <laughs> it was. Uh... And I remember I actually had a chance because I was taking like philosophy 10, like intro to philosophy, which was actually an unbelievably challenging course. And because all of this was happening, my my professor allowed me to write my paper on the war mm -hmm. and um, which was which was a great opportunity. And I think that also showed the willingness to have a dialogue more in that kind of an environment, which which I feel like, unfortunately, we've lost a lot right now, which is really. Oh, yeah, I, I think it's a complete travesty, actually, in, in every element of our yeah, society. Policy have changed so much. Like you talk about being conservative. Of like, I don't think people realize this. Ronald Reagan, he's like the corner, like the headstone of conservatism, right? I don't think he would not even get make it through the primary. Now. No, no, it was such a he, different thing. He would not. He would. Yeah, he, they would consider him as like a what's it called a Republican name only or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wouldn't make it. Yeah, right. And no, he, it's, it's and he's a, like the founding father of the Republican conservatives now, right? And yeah, then now, yeah, yeah. It's like it's amazing. It, they, don't, is, they, don't, they don't see it, right? No, no, I, it worries me actually, um, quite a bit. Our lack of ability to have the dialogue, the 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 polarization of of uh, of our country right now is it's really damaging and really dangerous. I think too. Yeah, I'm a firm believer. If somehow we could like get rid of the far left one percent, far right four percent, that could be so much better, right? I'm with you. <laughs> I'm it's, it's, totally it's with like, you. It's like those two percent dominate the media, the news, everything, right? And, and it's they, not you know, most of us fall, no. right? It's uh, but it's interesting as a veteran too. I don't know if you experience this, but I find both of those two sides those those far one percent on either side want to use you oh, as yeah, a veteran, without a doubt, right? Without a doubt. And I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't pull me into whatever it is that you're doing yeah. because I'm not with you. I'm probably not with you. I'm, I'm, I'm right in the middle, actually. Yeah, and so, it kills me like most of them either side, like, both are negotiating ten things, right? They're getting nine. Yes. But I can't get the tenth. I'm gonna blow it all up, right? Yeah. We got nine things. Oh no, this tenth issue is okay. It's very important. I get it, but you got nine things. Like, <laughs> take the victory and like fight the next day. But both sides, like, no, either all victory or all loss, right? And it's. it's insane it is not a recipe for a healthy society for sure so it's um it's too bad and it's too bad we can't have the conversations which i hope that we can start to work on you know be, being able to tease out some of the nuances and actually try to look at where it is that we have similar goals and and work towards those similar goals and instead of getting caught in these weeds of, of contention yeah so. and as a country we have to do better than biden trump 2024 like I mean, you would hope, I right? Mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. Trump's gonna be a convicted felon. He's he's gonna get nomination. I mean, he's like sixty points ahead. Like, there's there's no excuse for that. I, I'm sorry, like there just isn't. And I'm not again. Both one percent should be be carved off the edges. Yeah. I totally am with you, but there's no excuse for that. I, I don't understand how anybody can support that. I, truly, anybody. I yeah, I don't. But but thirty percent is right. Yeah, and then you so, got like you know DeSantis and that 
Indian billionaire, they're trying to out Trump. You're not going to out Trump. Yeah, it's like, pretty tough. I mean, yeah. there, there's some pretty brilliant stuff happening with the rhetoric mm-hmm. um, on that side, on that extreme one yeah. percent, uh, which is which is terrifying because it's effective. Um, but it effective. is rhetoric and yeah. it is uh, manipulation. And I think, unfortunately, because it's values based, it becomes more difficult for people to to tease that out of what it is that they're doing. And again, that happens on both sides. So yeah. yeah. And then on the Democrat side, suppose like. There's not even any debates on the Democrat side. It's like, you know, no debates at all. Just you know, there's like President Biden is gonna be, you know, dominated. Right. No one can compete against him. Like that doesn't sound right, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's the incumbency, right? I mean, I think it's the you know, usually have some kind of debates, you know, like at least but then, you know, why let him debate, you know, with you know. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I I, um, I remember there was, I think it's uh, the Alan Greenspan biography that uh, he says anyone that wants to be president shouldn't be allowed to be president. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, kind of feel like yeah. that's where we are in, in yeah. a lot of regards, but so. Yeah, I hope we figure yeah. it out. But I remember saying, I heard someone say, you know, countries get the leaders they deserve, right? So maybe this is speaking more about us as a country than, you know, the I mean, politicians, that's right? An interesting thing, right? It is an interesting thing to say is, uh, is what does this, how does this reflect on mm-hmm. us and how can we fix where we are as a country, as a society, so that we do have better options. And I think that's a a really helpful question. At the end of the day, a a country like ours is reflective of the people that we are. And so uh, that's that's on us. And of course, you always say the political, the Democrat and Republican parties have both failed everyone, right? With the way they do business and pick candidates, you know, like, do we need a third party? I don't know, like, Mm. this has to be something out there, you know? Yeah, I think there's some interesting work being done in a couple of different areas, but uh, but there's a lot of reform that needs to happen for sure within the system itself. There's no question. Yeah. All right. So moving on. So you've done a great job, like we said, putting yourself out there. Like, why don't we talk about how you got to appear on the NBC Today show? Oh, <laughs> that was a good earlier day. Yeah. <laughs> that that was actually. When, when is that? Oh, part. When was that? Yeah. That was in. Two- 2021, I think. Okay, so not, not long ago, yeah. Is that right? No, 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 no. It was 2020 because it was, I think, before but the before the book came out. Okay. And the book is about to be three. So the grit factor is the book. So how did it work? Like, like did that, you have a publicist, a PR team that got you on NBC? I mean. It was a total fluke. Honestly, it was a fluke. And the reason, um, I mean, it wasn't a fluke. There was an amazing publicist, but it was, the timing wasn't set up with the book because we didn't even have the title. We didn't have the cover. We didn't have any of that yet. But I had contracted with Harvard Business Review Press for the grit factor, Courage, Resilience, and Leadership in the Most Male-Dominated Organization in the World, uh, which uh, was a title that we came up with. But but their publicist did have a connection with the Today Show. And and she called, uh, I remember it was December, and she called, she said, this, is, this never happens, uh, and we're not really ready for it. But they want you to come in, I think it was January 1st or January 2nd. They want you to come to New York. Do you want to go? I was like, of course. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't pass that up. I don't, care, pass that I don't up. care if you're not ready or not. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? I don't right? care you haven't written a draft of your book yet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yeah. I actually remember the Grit Institute technically, which the Grit Institute is, is for me, it's, it, it, covers the speaking that I do when I speak at corporate events, big corporate events across the country and around the world. Um, I do training for big companies, for the Tuck School, and actually now for junior high and high school students as well. Uh, And then, of course, there's the writing. And I didn't have a website for it. So I remember I was literally on the airplane flying to New York, putting together like just a a bare bones website for the gritinstitute.com. And I was like, I got to have this up. I got to have this up. I got to have this up by the time. So so an army who had to stay in logistics just in time. So you were like, you had a website just in time. I had a website just in time. That's that's right. Exactly. So was it like intimidating to be on this TV show? You're like, you know, this is, I'm, I'm you know, I'm a, I'm the best person for this. I'm going to blow them away with like kind of like intimidating some nerves or something like that. Are you, are you just like, you know, I'm, they, you know, are you like, they invited me for a reason? Well, I didn't think about it because I think you think too much about it and then you get in your head and then you mess it all up. Although I did, um, I did stutter a little bit. I had to, to catch myself a couple of times, but you just sort of realize you're going to go on. You're going to have like a couple of minutes and then they're going to say, thanks. And, and this, that's it. And this is live, right? That's live. Yeah, no it's live. You know, it's, no, you know, it's only like, I think the video is like five, six minutes long. You don't have time to get a brain lock or. Right, exactly. Say, oh, give me a minute to think about that. Like, no, no, no. So you just have to, I mean, I, I think maybe it's probably like, you know, you get in the helicopter, you stay focused, right? You get on the. TV, you're just, I'm just having a conversation with you right now. I'm not thinking about your million viewers yeah. that are watching. <laughs> I wish. I wish. 
<laughs> so do they tell you the questions ahead of time? No, okay. no, no, not at all. So just yeah. like this, just like this. Okay. Yeah. Just having a conversation. So, and they're actually, they were, they're, they're professional yeah, and they're okay, having conversations. Yeah. So yeah. as you are, so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was actually a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun and it's over just like that. I mean, you walk on and you walk off. That's kind of it. And where's there, what do you get any, what happened after this? Like you see like an increase in book sales, increase in social media, like what for the benefit? Yeah. I was there a benefit for you out of this? I mean, I'm sure there was. Yeah. I don't know that I'm able to measure it or that I was. And the book wasn't out yet. Okay. So, I mean, I had my first book, but we how didn't about, talk about, how about the first How about this, the website that you just put on? Like, <sighs> could, you, could you say, hey, because this talk, NBC Today, I had 10,000 percent increase in website business or anything like that. Or is it more just like a just basically PR? Getting... It just, 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 okay. it's an additional piece of PR, but it's a helpful piece, right? Oh, and oh, I yeah. think people love it. And so yeah, it's, I mean, it's a it's nice on your thing stuff, to have on your, I can't remember where I found it. I think it was on your site, right? Like, yeah, 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 I mean, right. I mean, how cool is that? Like, I, <laughs> you, 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 like, like you can like, do a speaking gig. Who are you going to speak? Here's NBC today. We know what more proof you there need. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I won't mess it up for you. That's right. <laughs> so any, do you, any other like big, big name places you've been at? Besides uh, see today, I, I, not as much on the TV side. Um, the uh, I mean, what we the promotion that we did for the book was really you know Financial Times and Business Insider and Newsweek and that kind of thing. So those are the more of the publications, and there's some more academic kind of management type publications and more that are geared towards the leadership and HR world. Okay, HR. Uh, so um, so yeah, so those are more in print than they are uh, on film. But otherwise, the speaking that I do is typically for companies that want me to come out and keynote for big events. So, okay. so I think for yeah. the longest time, the speaking about the note, can women have it all? Can a woman have a career, be successful, uh, have an amazing family, the right pick of fence, cook dinner, on and on and on, right? Uh -huh. Is that even possible? Is this or is this a fantasy or like, <laughs> you know, like, I don't see like, you know, how can you like, be like president of, of Amazon, you know, and like yeah. you know, do all this different stuff, you know, unless you like yeah. hire like nannies and maids and, you know, and like do it like that way. But if you're doing it by yourself. Yeah. I mean, how can you like cook a home, uh, an excellent home cooked dinner, all this stuff, right? Yeah. Like, I, is it possible to have it all? Or is this a fantasy like, a lot of, that we're trying to put on women? I, I am not a white picket fence person myself. Um, I'm more of the wilderness person. So we have found that we live out in North Central Washington state. Um, and I have a husband and two boys who are 10 and 13. Um, so, uh, which is just my family situation. I think for people who do do, you know, CV, their, their, their CVPs or their um, SVPs or their president or CEO of a big company, like, like an Amazon or like, like anywhere actually um, that, yeah, they do have to find ways to help to support what it is that they're doing at home because uh, at least in the, the folks that I know will have nannies or they'll have other people that help. Um, but, you know, I think you think of it too, as like, or we think of it um, as you you make choices to support the lifestyle that you want to live and the way that you want to live with your family. And so my husband and I are both entrepreneurs. I'm an author and a speaker, and that allows me to be more flexible with my work schedule and um, and have more control over it than I would if I was still at Microsoft, at which I had a chance to work, you know, at Microsoft and in a medical device company. And um, they were both amazing, but you don't have any control of your schedule. So depends, right? I mean, there's there's financial rewards for being part of a big company that you don't get as easily or in the same way on your own, right? So I think you'll make your choices um, and uh, and having it all, I think you can have it all at different times, at different points, right? And you have to kind of think of it as like, okay, man, maybe we're really super heads down right now. Heads down right now, maybe we're, we're, we're making soup that we have <laughs> every day. And then we're making the nice dinner for company in a couple of months after I meet this deadline. And I think that's probably true whether you work for yourself or whether you work for a big company. So, so yeah, you can have it all, but not all at the same time. That's a good, great point. Yeah. What makes someone a good leader or even a great leader? That is, so there, I think there are many kinds of great leaders. There are, um, many different types of personalities that can lead really well. I've worked for leaders who are really, really outgoing and leaders that are very much more introverted and they can both be excellent. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the first thing is, is that they care for their people. They, they truly care about their people. They love their people and they take care of their people. So that's number one. Um, it's not the only thing, but it's number one. Uh, I think number two is they're very good communicators and they find a way to communicate well, both, um, uh, up the ladder, down the ladder, and and sideways, and that's a super important skill. And uh, and the third is they have to set a vision, right? And you've got to be able to 
have a vision and and be a little audacious with that vision, be willing to take the risks and be willing to fail and face up to that failure and continue on. Um, so I, if I had to say what makes a great leader, I think it's, yeah, taking care of your people is non-negotiable. Being a good communicator is pretty non-negotiable. And, uh, and then setting that vision is the leadership piece, right? Is we're going to take this in this direction and this is how we're going to do something and it and uh, and and we're going to make it work together. So. That was always one of my biggest pet peeves in, in the army or like post army yeah. work for people and they have no vision, right? Like, yeah. you're, like you're the blank, right? You, yeah. and you, you know what? You don't know what we want to do the next six months. Are you kidding me? Right. And that's a manager. Yeah. That's like, not a leader. Yeah. Right? What are you doing? Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's hard for people because it is taking a risk and they might fail. And I think that is part of the conversation that we've got to get better at having is, is, uh, you know, when you put yourself out there, when you take a big risk, when you're audacious, sometimes you're going to fail and yeah, you're probably yeah. going to fail a lot. And that, has to be something that you get comfortable with and you're comfortable acknowledging and living into because then you also give other people the permission to fail and pick themselves up and then get better. And that's how we get better is by pushing those envelopes and 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 pushing past those failures. I think another yeah. challenge too is like when people communicate, they're like, I'm only going to communicate on the phone or only on the email, only this. Like, yeah, yes. to, we have to communicate the way your people want to communicate. Yes. So maybe like, I mean, this is a bad example, but like I have a uh, my cousin's son, I talked to him on Snapchat. My aunt mm. is Facebook, right? So each, sure. so each based on age group, it's a different way I communicate with them, right? Yes. So I think you have to do the same thing with your people, right? You just can't say text or emails. I mean, of course, you have like a company-wide meeting, same time, okay, get on Zoom, right? But yes. I think you have to... I just, I don't understand when people do that. No. And I, I fall victim to this all the time. I, 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 e, I fail at this all the time, which I remember I, I sent an email recently to, or maybe it was a text to uh, one of my son's friend's mothers about some coordination. And she, and she emailed me back and she said, why don't you just give me a call? And I was like, right, because I'm emailing because I'm in my work mode, but, but this is another mom. And she's like, just give me a call. It's like, right. I just need to give her a call. And that is something too, that I, I'll actually speak to this, yeah. but then I fail in it myself is you've got to meet your people where they are. And you, you're right. You need to communicate with them the way that they need to communicate. And that is something that um, you've got to let other people drive. And that can be hard for some of us who are super execution oriented. No, on that, I will push back. I, mean, I hate me on the phone, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. Tell, I tell people all the time, if I'm calling you, it's like, it, it, I can tell you I'm on the $100 million lottery. Yes. I'm telling you something's really bad, right? Like, yes. Like, but you've communicated that. Yeah. And that's an important thing too, is to say, hey, I'm not comfortable on this, or I don't prefer this mode of communication. So how can we make this work together? And that's something that, you know, you work on in a relationship yeah. too, is like, hey, I'm most comfortable communicating this way, or this is important to me and what's important to you, you know, and then we figure it out. Yeah. Together. Or like, you know, I've seen the meme where like on the phone, someone gets a number from like sort of like, I don't answer numbers. I don't answer calls from numbers I know. Right. So what yes. chance do you have? Yes. <laughs> right. Like, 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 people I know, best friends call me. I don't answer the phone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, so I'm going to answer this random number. Yeah, get out yeah, of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't I don't answer it unless there's a name that pops up with it too. So I agree. So what drew you to aviation? What like what made you like want to be an aviator? Oh, so I grew up in Alaska, as you mentioned, and there are a huge number of private pilots there. There's a ton of aviation because it's the only way that you can get out to remote areas in Alaska. And so I had seen and had been on a few planes. I'd climbed an alley. We flew in to climb an alley, right? And um, had been on uh, small airplanes a few other times. And and so I always knew that I wanted to fly at some point. Uh, when I was in ROTC at Duke, I was part of the simultaneous membership program with the National Guard. So that meant that I had to join a guard unit as well for my last two years of college. And I was part of first of the 130th aviation in Raleigh, North Carolina. And at the time it was a, um, I'm forgetting all the terms now, but it was an it was one of those units where we had all different types of helicopters. So there were Blackhawks, Apaches, 58s, all of those. Um, and uh, later they became more streamlined. Again, I can't remember the initiatives, but it's probably changed again since then. Anyway, it's been a while. And uh, and so I, I loved aviation. I mean, I'd always wanted to fly. And then, of course, you get to the place where you take your commission. You're going to serve your time in service in uniform. It's like, well, what's the coolest thing I can do? Well, Definitely, it's fine, right? Um, so I think part of it was just being a young person and being excited, and and also just having a general interest uh, from growing up in Alaska. So, so you you, you chose to fly Apaches, right? Uh -huh. Think talking about some like the I remember the story like some guy said you'll never fly, yeah, you know that kind of mess, you know? Yeah, um, that's right. That so, very first colonel in the National Guard. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So how do you like how did you like work through like have grit so to speak like work through mm -hmm. like being the one of the first females, you know, can, can you talk about that story? Like how do you how to overcome that stuff? Like you didn't give up, like 
most people, oh, this guy, he's so he's a pro board colonel. He obviously knows what he's talking about. Let me go. Right. Let me go be some a few person or a few officers or something, right? Sure. How do you talk about like in, the internal whatever it is you have the inside internal of that, piece. Say, yeah. you know, like, you know, F you God, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna do this. Yeah. I, well, and I think part of it was growing up. I mean, all these different elements that we all have in our in our lives, right, inform what follows. And so I grew up, I was an athlete growing up. I was um, you know, did all the clubs, led all the clubs, did all the things, um, had been a skydiver, I'd climb big mountains. By the time I put my uniform on and took the oath of office, I had you know, climbed an alley. I had jumped out of airplanes 150 times, you know, I'd done, done all that stuff. And so I think that builds, builds confidence in who it is that you are. And I had more confidence then in who I was. Uh, and so having done well, you know, I was also young, so I'd done well for a, couple, a few years in ROTC. And so then I had this Colonel say, you know, you will never fly an attack aircraft. And, and at the, at, when he said that, by the way, they weren't open to women to fly. So that was not potentially unusual. It was just a very strange thing to say, given that they weren't open to fly, uh, which meant it wasn't a possibility. And so I think I just had enough confidence from the different experiences that I had had up to that point. And I was young and naive enough to be able to say, to go back to our, the ROTC detachment and say, hey, I want to go on active duty. I don't want to be in the National Guard where this guy is not going to let me. I think I also had a sense of the Guard at that point that, um, and no offense, there's a lot of wonderful Guard officers and the Guard people and soldiers, but but they don't they don't change over so much, right? So there's so kind this of like an old boy network, so to speak. Old boys network. And like in the active duty, people at least change positions every year or two years, yeah. and then they get transferred to different bases. In the Guard, they just stay because they're local, right? And, uh, and so I knew that that was a difficult thing that was not going to be surmountable probably on my own. Um, and I didn't want to be somewhere that I didn't, wasn't wanted oh, yeah, either. Right. Yeah. Like you don't want to be somewhere where you're not wanted. So, th so that helped to give me that kind of confidence. We also had really great leadership in the ROTC program. And I'm so grateful for that leadership. So I went back to major Lindemann. I remember his name was, he was an aviator. And I was like, sir, I want to go active duty. And he's like, we're past the deadline, but I'll see what we can do. And, um, and so he, he he got me through, which was great. And then right after that is when combat aviation opened to women, when the combat exclusion clause was lifted. And so then Apaches were open to women. Everything was open to women, finally. And so you'd have to, you had to, was there some kind of application process to apply to be an Apache pilot? How did that work? So you go to you go to flight school. Everyone goes to the same flight school. You go to aviation officer. And that's the one at Fort Rucker, right? Fort Rucker, right, which has a different name now that I, oh, I don't yeah, know yeah, yet. I yeah, but that, yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> Um, but um, so so went down to Fort Rucker Aviation Officer Basic Course, the initial entry rotary wing course, and in that course they do some assessments and you make a, you make requests. And so that doesn't mean that because you ask for the Apache you'll get the Apache, or because you ask for the Blackhawk you'll get the Blackhawk. But you you put in your preferences. And, and this um, based on like like test scores, like simulations, or I bet it's based on all kinds of stuff. Okay. You know, we did these funny tests where you have like um you have pedals and you have like a joystick and you have to you. Have a headphone on where they're saying numbers in one side and letters in the other, and you have to type out like the even numbers. So or... you have a lot of information coming in on the screen, outside sources, like yeah, it was. You gotta be, be able to take it all in and decipher what's really important, right? Right, and you leave that you leave that test thinking you've completely failed, like you're going to be the one that gets kicked out because I, I I don't know how it's set up, but it's set up to certainly feel pretty impossible. Mm -hmm. But somehow I guess they're assessing this, and there's the psychological evaluation, and so. And I imagine there's also the assessment of like, how many women want to fly Apaches? We just opened this up. We better get one. Yeah, we need one. Yeah. one. So I imagine all of those factor in. I went back when I was writing the grip factor and requested information on how many women were in different roles at the time. And the Army Aviation Center said they didn't have that information, which is shocking to me. But yeah. at the time, there were 2% women in aviation at least as as that was the understood kind of number, which sort of made sense. And there was a negligible number in attack aviation. And to be honest, I don't think there's a whole lot more. Like it's not, it certainly hasn't come up in in, in any measurable quantity. So uh, there are other women that are flying attack, but um, but not a lot. So yeah. I know like an like, in, in infantry, if they go to ranger school, they like 60 days, two, three hours of sleep a night. I'm right. thinking with aviation, there's not like there's like there's like sleep deprivation, is it? Like that is you, not a not a okay. thing in aviation. Yeah, you're not you're not flying a tower of sleep, right? So test no. to test you, right? They they actually, the sleep what's called crew rest or sleep rest is a really rest, big thing. Yes. Crew rest is a big thing, right? It's it's a big thing because they want to make sure that you don't kill yourself or crash the helicopter. I know that becomes a point of contention with the infantry because uh, you guys don't get any sleep, and so, um, but but I will say in in the defense of uh, aviators, there's never an aviator that I met, no matter how 
cocky and self-assured that believed anything other than that we were there to support the infantry. Yeah. Like our mission was to support the infantry. That's it. And, uh, you know, in Fort Bragg, which is now Fort Liberty, right? I'm going to, I need to learn all these new names. Uh, but our, our mission was deep attack. So that was going, you know, deep over enemy lines in, as a battalion of helicopters and killing enemy tanks. But at the end of the day, we, we deployed to Bosnia and we did armed aerial reconnaissance in teams of two. So, the reality sometimes doesn't necessarily connect to the mission, um, but whatever we were doing, we were there to support who's on the ground. And I don't think anyone ever thought anything different. So, so when I was enlisted, when I was in the Army for came to OCS, I spent three years at a 427 Aviation Battalion, Fort Hood, Texas, right? Oh, okay. So was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the brigade, we had like a 17 calf, was a division calf. I was in the Black Hawk unit. And then 127 was aviation, was aviation was an Apache, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the name of the brigade commander. He became, he became like assistant division commander. Actually became the division commander for first, fourth ID in Fort Carson later. Okay. I can't remember. They used to call him commander something, right? He was like the big superstar aviation brigade commander. Oh. Commander Cody. Oh, yeah. Cody. yeah, yeah. Cody. He's Cody. famous. Yeah, Cody, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's fam- I never had a chance to meet him. But, uh, I remember right before we was OCS, yeah. and like he sat me down. And I talked for like an hour, like what officers do, what they don't do. Like It was like, it's so awesome, right? Like I'm thinking to myself, this dude's about to put on one phase of time to talk to me about yeah. OCS, right? It's like room error, right? Oh, that's fantastic. But, but he was like so charismatic. Like he just like, he just knew like, yeah, he was like, he, he's communicated well, all that kind of stuff, right? Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. No, I never had a chance to meet him, but he certainly is a, is is uh, is famous in oh, the yeah. aviation community. I'm afraid like how like Oracle Army Times, like we got named commander from Fourth ID, like aviation envy. If, right. If your officer's mad because the aviator becomes no division commander, right? Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah, there's always that um, uh, sometimes healthy, sometimes unhealthy competition, but uh, yeah. that exists everywhere, doesn't it? Yeah, I've always used yeah. an example like a, a leader who I, I, I thought like actually got it right, you know, like yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, which is um, not always the norm, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, no, it's not. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah. So back to ABA. So when did they tell you you're going to be a Apache pilot? And what was your reaction? Were you like happy, surprised? Like, well, yeah, I was. Oh, were you like, of course they picked me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't think that. Um, I know I was really excited. So there's a point in in flight school where you track, you go into, well, at least again, used to. I'm not sure what it is today, but we used to track into either lift or um, the uh, scout and attack track. And so they have to tell you before that point. So I tracked into scout and attack. Um, so it was probably two thirds of the way through, give or take. And were you the only female that got picked? Uh, Yes, I think that's right. And that may have been because the others didn't want it either too. I, I'm not sure. Um, but in scout and attack, yes, there were not any other women. When I got to the Apache transition course, there was one other woman who had been a Cobra pilot, actually. Um, I forgot all about Cobras. Yeah. yeah, I know. Cobras, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was a thing. <laughs> all about Cobras. Still a thing in the Marines, I think. But yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so there were very few women. But you know, the academic environment is um, is not one where there's a lot of I don't, I, I didn't experience a lot of sexism in, in the academic environment. You're just all there at school, like you're at college. And it's like when I talk to um, young women at business schools and they have come from college into consulting firms, into business school, and they're like, well, there's not really a, what's the difference? You know, there's, the, I don't know why people worry why there needs to be a women in business club. And I'm just like, I haven't been out there too long. <laughs> but you realize like they've just been in these kind of semi-academic environments, sometimes going into consulting firms, which at their early entry stages can be more like academic environments and uh and and things get a little bit trickier as as you get further along. No, I could make this yeah. up. I think part of your speech at the Museum Bone of Flight of Bone, whatever it's called, like you showed a picture of yourself, like the other 10 guys who graduated. Oh yeah. And you, I, I, one thing you said, like you perfectly wore your skirt to show. Uh, that I'm a female here and that other females can see what you did. Purposely wear my skirt. We just always wore skirts then, okay. right? Like that was just the thing. Um, but um, yeah, that was, I, I look back on that and these are all these old oh, maybe, maybe, now. maybe you said like you personally did your legs a certain way. So you, you show off your legs. No, no, no. no I'm I, that just mean there, I was taught at the picture. Somebody's took a picture in the front row are the honor grads. Uh-huh. <laughs> And so I always like to say, well, I made sure that there was a skirt in the front oh, row. That's what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but um, but no, I, I love that somebody snapped that picture. It's a fun one to have for sure. And that was just our graduation from initial entry rotary wing and the um the scout and track attack tracks. So and so you you finish um the flight school, you go to first unit. Mm-hmm. What was your reaction from like a command team? We were, they were like welcome arms or like, oh shit, we gotta have the first female. What is this? Well, it depended on who it was. I mean, this is the reality of I think most experiences is that there are really amazing people to work for and with, and there are not 
so amazing, right? It's sort of the bell curve and the army is really the bell curve because it draws from everywhere. Um, I had an amazing battalion commander then. He was then Lieutenant Colonel McDonald. He was later my brigade commander. And um, I think he retired as a two-star and his wife was also a Lieutenant Colonel, also a battalion commander in Blackhawks. And so he was, he was totally supportive. He was amazing. And I think, um, I'm really grateful that I worked for him as my first battalion commander. I think uh, among the pilots, among um, uh, other other officers, there there was mixed reception. Mm -hmm. But you know, but generally speaking, people were not unfriendly. Yeah. I, it just depended on who it was, and and it tended to be more subtle when there were issues. So, yeah. So you did a lot of amazing things in your military army career, but you got our ten. So several questions. One, like, I would have to think like you've been the, one of the first female aviators that you would have begun, but like. Like, like, like track to do great things, right? Like first female aviator, put on the career path below zone, make her like, you no know, ten commanders, like set for success, right? Mm. But we decided to get out of 10. Can you talk about that thought process of all that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it was, it's a, it's a complex, uh, it was a complex decision to make, but I, I, I think at the end, Really, when I ended up making that that decision, and I had decided a year and a half before getting out. So I was in Korea. I tried to extend in Korea because my time would have expired in Korea. And um, but you know, as soon as they move you, you have another year, right? They you you incur another year of obligation. And so I tried to extend in Korea. They didn't let me extend in Korea. Um, and I remembered the first time that I knew for sure that I wanted to get out, and it was after my thirty days leave in Korea. I had gone down to. Um, Australia for a week by myself and learned how to scuba dive. I'd gone to China for three weeks and done this, this kind of adventure travel sort of a trip and came back and just felt like I saw these rows of Quonset huts and I just felt like it was deadening. Like I, like all, there was no room for creativity. There was no room for like expansiveness. And, and that was my reaction. That doesn't mean that that is the case. I would just want to qualify that. That was my experience of that. But I knew then I was like, you know, this is not a place that I wanted, that I want to stay. And, and part of it also was looking at people who were more senior than I was and saying, I, I don't want that life. You know, I remember the other part and I had already decided at this point, but deploying to Kuwait just for a month, it was just a month long exercise when I was stationed at Fort uh, Bliss, Texas. So we deployed to Kuwait and we're waiting for, for the, for the manifest, we get, you know, you get, you get manifested multiple times before you finally get your flight out. And I remember I looked over to one side, it's 112 degrees or 115 degrees or something. And on one side of me, there's a private sitting on his duffel bag. I'm sitting on my duffel bag. I'm a captain. Look to my other side. There's a colonel sitting on his duffel bag. And I'm like, it never changes, does it? <laughs> it's just like this all the time. And I, I, I think there at the I think when I look back at at that decision, part of it was that I knew that there was a part of me that was not going to be able to to um, to give my best in that environment. And that was again my experience how how I felt in that at the time. Um, and not true for for every human, but uh, but for me that was the case. And I think there was a creative element that I was really missing, and that was not going to be something that I found in the military. I have to imagine there are people yeah. like senior leaders in the military unit, or whatever, were like, "Hey, Shannon, you're the first female Apache pilot. You well. can't quit. Like, you can't leave the <laughs> army. Like, we invest this money. We've done this, you know, for you, so to speak. No, like." Yeah, like you have to stay in, right? I have to imagine some people are like putting their pressure on you. My last unit was a was a one star command, and um, and I remember General Vane <laughs> said he said what, and I still feel some shame over this actually, some guilt. But he said what would it, what would it take to keep you in? And I said you know it would take a second command in the CAV at Fort Carson, followed by a foreign area officer assignment. And uh, the thing is, when a general asks you what it is that you want, what I didn't know is that then that happens, right? So then at the same time, like within one day of each other, I got my orders to Fort Carson. Um, he said, you know, your command will be six months in because they're, they were like 200% strength cap because everyone wants to go to Fort Carson, right? Um, and at, then I got my acceptance to the Tuck School at Dartmouth um, MBA program. And, and I felt incredibly guilty because I went to General Vane and I said, sir, yeah, I don't know that you, I, I don't know if I said this to him, but like, I don't know if he's going to be there the next time. If it takes a general to get the thing that I'm looking for, then he may not be there the next time. And I've known and, so many people diverted to like an XO and, position yeah, in Korea and, and because they have to fill it. For another general to override his exactly right. And then you're just at the whim of of the system and and these and that was not how I that's that wasn't the the life on purpose that I wanted to lead. Yeah. Nice. So next. 
Talk about how do you influence other women to tell the story? Mm. We have to start by telling your own, right? And I think that's something that I've recognized has been important is by telling my own, I empower other people to tell theirs. Um, and, uh, and, and that, again, did not come easily. When I first started writing The Grip Factor, I could not use the word I. I kept writing we, we, we. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I can't speak for anybody else. I can only speak for myself. And, uh, and we're conditioned in the military to, to, to not speak at all, right? To just do our jobs. So that's just sort of not the culture. But also it's as a woman and as a woman in the military, certainly not. And so it really took a lot to overcome that and kind of own those experiences as, as my own, which is important because another woman may have a different experience. Another man may have a different experience. Another leader will have a different experience. Uh, and so this is just my experience that I can, that I can share. Uh, so by telling my own, I hope I empower others to do that. And also by speaking to the, the idea that by telling our stories, by sharing our stories, by by men sharing the stories of women, right? We empower everybody to come to the table with the best that they have to offer. And with all of the issues in the world right now, again, we really need that to be the case. We we need not to limit others. We need to make sure everybody has that chance. And so speaking to that, I think helps helps too with, with that inspiration, but it, it does come down to everybody's individual choice. I know this has yeah. been a lot of people will say like, what do military veterans need to do? Like transition better? People like resumes this. I'm like, to uh, me, to me, we have to train military veterans to switch, like you say, from we to I, right? Yes. Because yes. in the civilian world, you say we, we did this. Like, well, I need to hire your team then. Like, what do you do, right? Right. And it's such a hard, and I had a horrible time with it, right? Yes. And like, how do we train people to do that, right? It's it's hard. It is hard. It is hard. And it is hard. You have to be able to trans. I think there's both a degree of... Um, of pride that we need to instill in people and confidence that while your experience as a veteran may not directly relate to this other role, you have, you have much more general experiences that will be incredibly impactful and helpful and what companies are looking for. So having the confidence to own that, but also having the humility to say that, hey, you might've been an aviation commander or an infantry, special forces, whatever, right? And that doesn't make you all that like you need to still yeah. go learn the job in wherever it is that you're starting to work now and have the humility to, to understand that you're kind of starting over in some regards, but you have a lot to offer as well. And so it's this kind of this balance of both confidence and humility, I think, is really important to instill in veterans. Um, but I think the biggest issue is, is the confidence is that's that's lacking. Uh, and uh, and I, I am just starting to see this more and more in my work with companies and with the veteran ERG groups and saying, OK, let's. Let's, let's see how we can start to address this and start to encourage people to, to, to go up for those promotions, to, to promote themselves as more than the technician. And I hear that a lot from people. It's like, well, I'm just sort of thought of as a technician, but I was like leading these groups in battle. And, uh, and so you've got to tell those stories so that people understand what it is that you're capable of too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a balance. I remember when I was going to transition, when I retired, this SAR major, like, Stillman said, like, I'm a retired SAR major. Yeah. You know, people do what I tell them to do. We're like, uh, I don't it's not going to work. That, you know, I don't know about that, right? So I don't know what happened to me. In another case, like, you know, like, I think a lot of, especially senior leaders, they're saying, you know, I'm a major, I'm a colonel, I'm whatever. Yeah. And they expect to become a you know, VP of, of, of something at Microsoft. Right. Like, no. I'm like, no. I mean, obviously, you're not going to become a, like an admin clerk, right? Sure. But like, you know, kind of tailor down a little bit. I think too many people in the military, yes. like, I, I'm this level, so I should be at this level higher. Like, I, yeah. let, I have 20 years experience. I let 10,000 troops, whatever case be. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Surely I can, like, you know, and it's like, and they get, you know, a rude awakening, you know? They do, they do. And and that is too, I think there's some just kind of comfort that isn't going to come for some time, right? And just sort of trusting that process is really important. So balance the humility with the confidence, trust the process. That's so important. And uh, and and talk to other vets, read the stories, read the grip factor, yeah. <laughs> you know, read those stories and, and start to understand how it is that you can navigate that new world. It's just like if you, it's not just like, but it, you could make many, many different parallels. And one of them could be picking up a new sport, mm -hmm. right? You might get a coach. You're going to do some training. You're going to read about it. You're going to watch some videos on it. And you've got to do all those same things for what it is that you do as you transition from the military into the civilian world. Yeah. I know yeah. I'm going to say people make an automated, like you, you get to take the first job. I tell people now, like if you're, yes. it comes to is different, but if you can do nothing for six months, right? Yes. Like, do nothing for six months. Like, yeah. you know, you know, do something else, right? Yes. But too many people like me, like, start working we're just on like you know terminal leave whatever you know yeah and like and we take a job we probably shouldn't take you know and it's a horrible yeah. job and then like yeah 
Right. And then you lose confidence too. Right. And that's, that's not good either. Yeah. I think that's a great recommendation that I remember I was actually just list, re-listening to on my podcast, the grit factor, which is now called facing the wind. I interviewed this actually amazing civilian woman who was uh, uh, actually a, um, her father was in the military and, and passed away and she's now the CEO of Workboard. She's fabulous. So Deidre Packman's episode is amazing. And I said, what would you recommend to, to veterans? And I thought this was such great advice. She said, you know, try, different things, like try three different things, give yourself like three months to yes. try a certain kind of yes. job, then do three months on something else, even as a volunteer, right? So you're just trying different things out. And don't make yourself make a decision for as long as you can, like give yourself as long as you can, not as, probably more than six to 12 months. Yeah. But, um, but, but don't be afraid to try things out, because you don't know. I mean, cultures are different, requirements are different. It's, it's a different world, for sure. Yeah, I think another mistake a lot of military people make is like, there's this thing to say you're going to get half your pay if you retire, right? Yeah. But it's not really true, right? Because the housing is not part of it, right? So only we're getting like a third of your, your, your salary, right? Sure. And a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm retiring three years. Let me buy a new car, a new house, you know, which probably is not the best time to buy yeah. new financial stuff. Then you can stress and you like, I have to get a job. Exactly. I have to get a job, right? Yes. Yeah. No, I think living within your means is a super important thing that um, all of us need more training on for sure. My husband's business is Tiller Money and it's a cloud-based spreadsheet solution that helps you to keep track of all of the spending that way. And I think uh, we all need to do more of that, right? At the end of the day, you you live within your means and then you have more options. If you don't live within your means, you have fewer options. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's, and that's true at fewer, any level fewer, of income. And fewer and worse options. And fewer and worse options, right. And that's true for people who make exorbitant amounts of money too, right? That buy big houses or yeah. fancy cars or big boats. And then all of a sudden, you may not like your job, but you're going to be there for a yeah, while. Because so on you, yeah, you're making <laughs> yeah. 350000 a year, but then you're paying like 10000 a month going off to eat or 10000 for this or 24000 this. Yeah, you got to be careful, right? And they call it the golden handcuffs, I think. So it's, yeah. So back at putting, your, putting like females putting yourself out there, kind of on the subject, not on the subject, right? So talking about like a gender pay gap, right? Yeah. So stats show like post mean you get a get a job. We'll say we're we're both doing marketing, right? Right. And they offer both seventy thousand a year. Stats show like ninety five percent time ninety five percent time I'm gonna say, hey guy, that's not enough anymore. Yes. And so now I have eighty thousand. Just gotta ask. Yeah. Stats show ninety five percent of the time you're gonna say, oh my goodness, I'm so thankful for this job, and you're right. seventy thousand. Right. And then a year later, we book a ten percent raise. Obviously, right. that expounds. Yes. And, and to make it worse, stats show. 90% of the time, I've worked for six months. Yeah. Hey, boss, I come on time every day. I need a raise. Okay, yeah, you do a raise. You, mm -hmm. stats show, you might have done something like, like bought on a $10 million contract, increased something like that's, that's outstanding. So right. you ask for a raise. I'm just doing my job. Like, how do you convince females, like, no, put, your, like, put yourself down? Of course, some people yeah. say yeah. management should not be doing that, but, you know, that's the fact of the game, right? Right. Like, the, how do you change that? Well, one? part of the challenge is that the statistics also show, the studies also show that when women ask for a raise or when they do negotiate their salary, they uh, that's held against them. And that that is considered- I, I did not know that. It's interesting. Yeah, right? I, I'll send you the study yes, after this. So yeah. it's, it's interesting. That's disappointing. Um, it is disappointing. And I think part of that is, is, is letting people know, making sure that everybody knows this. So number one, if you're a manager or a leader, hold yourself accountable to not doing that for the people that are working for you, right? Make sure you're bringing them in at the same level if they have the same qualifications or ensuring that you're you're being um, equitable in how it is that you're thinking about compensation for raises and bonuses and that sort of thing. Um, but for women especially is, is letting them know as well and say, listen, here's the stats. There's no reason this should be the case. And so given that, uh, how can you challenge yourself to maybe push yourself a little bit more out of your comfort zone to be able to speak to that? And, you know, on the speaking circuit, I hear this all the time too, is I'll go speak for a conference and, you know, the speaking business is a funny thing. We, we get paid a lot of money to, to show up and do a good job for an hour. Um, but I will have people come up to me and say, you know, so-and-so who's a guy came and spoke to us last year and he wasn't nearly as good and he charges twice as much. And I'm just like, man, so if, you know, if you're that conference organizer, Pay, pay what you pay, right? And I think, so all of us can be part of the solution for that. But in terms of encouraging women, I would just make sure that people know, women know that, and then encourage them to say, hey, get out of your comfort zone and and, and ask for what you're worth because you are worth that. Yeah, I know, I can't think of his name, but one tech startup guy, his solution was not to negotiate salary at all, right? So, but I don't know if that's, yeah. but I don't know if that's the solution either, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's too far the other way. I don't know. I mean, Saturn was a great car company because you couldn't negotiate. You just went and bought the car, right? So yeah. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think there's, um, 
I think it will probably always depend on the market and what the market will support, yeah. right? And so- uh, and, and that's a good point too. I had a friend a while ago, she put on LinkedIn, like she complained, like, I don't you know, I'm tired of the gender pay, right? And, but she was complaining because she learned a friend of hers who worked in Seattle would make more money than her, right? They're both HR people, right? Mm. But I had to break her down like offline. Okay, let's break it down. Like, like labor market, this guy works, and they both had like the same experience, same years, right? But like, he worked in Amazon in Seattle, right? Yeah. She worked at a nonprofit in like this lower town of Arkansas, right? Well, you can't, you can't yeah, compare yeah. that. She's a I mean, parent, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. There's no comparison there. I yeah. mean, that's cost of I, living, I that's corporate that. versus nonprofit. I mean, all of those things. I, think, I mean, I think, you know, there, there are things that are unfair for sure. And we need to work towards solving those inequities. At the same time, we all make our own decisions, right? Yeah. And if we, you and I want to go apply for a job at Microsoft again and work at Microsoft, then great, go, go do that. And if you don't, then, then figure it out where you are. And yeah. so I think we have to also take responsibility for our own choices. And I'm a big fan of accountability as well as equity. <laughs> so next, talk about embracing failure and the points of embracing failure. Yeah, it's so hard, right? It's so hard when you push yourself to succeed and you are rewarded for success to embrace. Um, embracing is hard. I, I Maybe it's acknowledging and owning it that's important. And then saying, what do I do with this failure? How can I use this failure to to grow and to be better next time? Um, and I, I, when people ask me about how do you create a culture of uh, grit and resilience, a culture that is willing to take risks, I actually had a company that asked me this. This is now a number of years ago, and I was doing a, a keynote for them. It was a virtual keynote, and we had probably eight rehearsals which is, I, I've never heard of anything like that because they wanted everything to be perfect. And I was like, wow, there is no tolerance for failure in this company. And, and that's kind of like good for the space shuttle, but not so good for like the rest of, of operations, right? And so I think um, when we think about it for ourselves or for our, our, our organizations, we've got to be willing to allow for pushing ourselves out of where it is that we're comfortable falling down and saying, okay, what can we do better next time? How can we make that adjustment? It's a hard thing to do. But again, when we acknowledge that, and okay, this is hard to do, but you will grow from failure. So let yourself fail. It's okay. You know, uh, it, it's an, a great opportunity. So part of it is the awareness. And then you're able to work from that. Some of it, you just have to push through, right? Because you're, you fail and you're like, I, you know, I tell this story about being in Bosnia and I had grown up in the army under this first battalion commander who I have a ton of respect for, and I, um, who was then again, Colonel McDonald. And he had said, when he pinned on my first Lieutenant bars, he said, the only good use of any increased power you will ever have is the increased responsibility to take care of your people. And I had internalized that. I believed that I, I worked to live that. And, uh, and I remember in Bosnia with a platoon that I had taken in another battalion, one of my pilots was sick. We were just getting ready to deploy to, to, to Glamok, which was a deployment within a deployment to go do a gunnery, kind of fun, something different. And uh, and I remember I heard from somebody else said, you know, hey, Chuck's not feeling too good. And I went to Chuck, he's my instructor pilot, this guy from Texas, he spoke about half of the speed that I speak, but super, super smart, super great guy. I said, Chuck, I hear you're not feeling that great. You know, you don't have to deploy. You don't have to come with us to Glamok. You can come out in another cockpit. Another, another flight when the next company comes out and he said, no, LT, you know, I think I'm doing okay and can't do Texas. Sorry. Uh, but, um, and we, we flew out to Glamock, we shut down and then went to the tactical operations center. And I remember the company IP came up and talked to me and he said, Hey, LT, we need to get a medevac for George, um, or sorry for, for Chuck, he's bleeding out of both ends. And we called a the medevac. They took him back to Tuzla, got his bags, took him to a hospital in Germany. And it turns out he had Crohn's disease. Mm. And when that medevac took off, George came up and talked to me. George was our company IP. And he said, LT, you've got to take care of your people. And I kind of bristled, you know, like I was like, I know that. Like I've been, I've been working on that. I've been living that. And uh, I said, George, you know, I, I asked him how he was doing. And he said he was okay to go. And he said, LT, sometimes you've got to take care of your people when your people can't take care of themselves. And that was a lesson for me in that I had failed. Yeah, but you bet they hit you pretty hard. Yeah, it did. And you know, it did. I, I had totally failed in like my primary mission. And 
And yet we had to go out and fire a gunnery and we had to go out and, and I had to go out and be the platoon leader. And, and so there was no time to like wallow in that or to feel ashamed and like shut down or like curl up on my cot. Right. It was, you got to get out there and do your thing. And so I think that was a, it was a helpful lesson looking back on that and saying, yeah, I had failed. Like I, I screwed it up and I didn't take care of somebody that needed me to kind of step in where he wasn't willing to. And, uh, and and then you got to get up and you got to keep going and you've got to tell yourself how you're not going to do that the next time. So you've got to get better at it for the next time. And that's that's what all of us have the opportunity and the responsibility to do. So next talk about this. I think a lot of people, a lot of people like me have problems with this and that's embracing success. Embracing success. Yeah. Yes. Like, like, yes. I, like I don't deserve success. I, I put all the hard work. I've done this, but but yeah, I don't yes. know. I'm, I'm ready to take the accolades or whatever. You know, I'm not ready for these rewards. You know, even though I know I deserve it, it's like, yeah, I think a lot of people are afraid of success. You know, that is a a very thoughtful question because I think that many of us are more afraid of that than we are afraid of failure. And I, I feel like it's something that we don't always even recognize in ourselves. I think I have some of that also where you realize like, wow, I may be holding back here because I don't think maybe I deserve that or I'm not the right person for that. Or it's doubting yourself, right? I just watched a, a short uh, interview, short section of an interview with Steven Spielberg. And he was asked like, do you ever, do you ever doubt yourself? You know, like Steven Spielberg, right? And he said, every single time I make a movie, I doubt myself. Every single time I start a movie, I think I am never going to be able to get that where it needs to be every time. And every day he walks out there thinking he's probably not going to be able to make it work. And I, so I think all of us that, that push ourselves and push our comfort zones, doubt ourselves. And it's really important to, again, it's this awareness of that, be aware of that. And so you can push through that as best you can, because that can be as damaging or more damaging than the fear of failure. Can you talk about your own podcast real fast? Like how it got yeah. started, who you talked to and all those kind of things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have two seasons out right now of, it was initially the grit factor and now it's called Facing the Wind. Um, and I talked to, leaders, uh, again, in the vanguards of their field. So they're not all military. So my, in the, in the grit factor, I'm using all examples of military leaders, right. That happen to be women. They've all faced this double crucible of an incredibly challenging job on top of not necessarily being supported in their work. Um, in the podcast, I expand that. And so there are a couple of people that are part of the grit factor book that are on the podcast as well. Uh, but there are also some others because they're, you know, you just start to, the world starts to open up when you start to do this work and you meet all these other incredible human beings. And also had the chance to interview, you know, like a technology CEO. This is Deidre Packnad, who's just amazing. Who's I'm bringing her up twice because I literally just listened to our episode again. But um, Mandy Hickson, who is actually a pilot in the Royal Air Force, is, is another one of the interviewees. And Sandra Stoltz, who's an admiral in the Coast Guard, the first woman to run one of the academies. And so all of these incredible leaders. Um, the next season, I'm just starting to plan out right now, but it will be both men and women. Um, I'll always have 50% women, always. I think that's the, the goal. Uh, and and always, of course, speak to the to the military and the veteran experience as well. So, how do you determine what men to come on? It's a great do, question. Do you have to like do you have to something in their social media like so they support women doing something or like based on a field? Like, how do you yeah do that? I, I what I am hoping to be able to evolve into next is to be able to say how do I look at people who are who are speaking to this particular topic in a meaningful way? And how do I bring in diverse voices who are speaking to this specific topic in this in this um, particular way? And by doing that, by bringing in voices that are both men and women uh, to this area of, of focus, which will be a slightly new area of focus in the next season on, on this facing the wind, on, on courage, on this willingness to be able to step outside of where we're comfortable to make these contributions. Um, and looking at those sources of discomfort and how we push through those again, those uh, I I will be looking for people who have really addressed that thoughtfully, and again trying to look for a diverse group of voices that um, that bring different perspectives to bear on that on that same uh, idea. So I'm sure this person never agreed to this or or like that, but I think it's interesting. In if you bought on the guy that told you females never fly. Yeah. You know what? I've actually thought about that. I don't know if it would be the same podcast or a different podcast. Or maybe not him, but maybe somebody yeah. like, will say like, I won't say like they're anti-women or anti-females. A different perspective. Because no one's right? going to say that out loud, right? Sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe like you just, you know, like I think that'd be a good conversation to have, you know. 
I agree with you. I remember when I was in college, I um, I attended a triangle city, so like Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, right? It's the, the research triangle park. And there was a triangle securities conference and um, there were several generals there. Rhonda Cornum was there, who was the uh, flight surgeon who was shot down and was a POW in the first Iraq war. And she was there um, with her, I think now ex-husband, but um, in her flight suit. And and the discussion, it was Max Thurman, General Thurman was there. And his argument was that women should not fly in combat. This was before combat exclusion was listed, lifted because they were more valuable than men because they had the capacity to bear children. I remember the argument. You remember the argument, remember the yes. Argument. And I remember Rhonda Cornum, who had a 15-year-old daughter, I think maybe even at the time her daughter was 15, standing up and making the argument said, you know what? We have, we should have the choice to decide what risk we take on to to decide whether or not we put ourselves in danger. That's our choice to make, and uh, and that's a it's a legitimate conversation, right? Yeah. I, it's a very interesting it conversation, and I I actually to the point that we when we first started uh, this conversation today about bringing diverse voices together that disagree. We need to do more of that, and I I would love I, I actually think that could be another really interesting podcast and. Uh, to, to just talk about, you know, hey, here's here's somebody who thinks that we should keep certain books out of school libraries. Here's somebody who thinks that they're all fair game. Why? Why? What? What's yeah. our commonality? And uh, and there are points of of common interest, mm -hmm. right? I think we're making things too polarized, too black and white, too binary. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's not a binary conversation. None of these are. I remember. All, all I remember was, you know, have females not going to camera was like, what kind of country are are we going to be if we can detest and like, desensitize with females dying, like. What kind of do we want to be a country where we just like oh 25 females died in combat yesterday and like don't care about it like i remember that's been an argument too yeah well i think uh and and for that one i i would love for again this should be a great conversation right to say well let's look at the um maternal mat mortality rate in the u.s so if you want to talk about women dying we can talk about where we're desensitized <laughs> Sorry to bring that up, in yeah. that. <laughs> but, but, you know, but really, That's but these are, point. Yeah. But there are, there are bigger conversations, right? So are we, dense, are we okay with women dying in childbirth? Because we, right now we rank terribly uh, yeah. among yeah. very wealthy countries that way. Um, but, but we don't want them to die in combat. I mean, that, that's a little death, silly. Death, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a death's a death. And then frankly, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, the more conservative argument might want to support women um, in their more maternal roles, but we're not, yeah. right? Uh, so whatever that is, liberal, conservative, doesn't matter. But just coming to the table to say, we value life, yeah. right? We value a woman's life. We value a man's life. So so then where does that take us? And I'm going to take a little tangent for you really quickly, because I, one of the interesting conversations right now around um, AI is, you know, is this AI going to take over the world and, you know, kill all the humans, <laughs> whatever. Um, but one of the interesting arguments I've, I just read recently was, what if in designing AI, because AI is designed, right? It's designed by humans to, what if we are looking at this design to say, well, hey, uh, we have all these biases, but we know they're wrong. And so can we design AI so that it doesn't have those biases, so that it's kinder, so that it's more compassionate? It's an interesting alternative idea. I don't know that if that's realistic or not, but I love the idea that says, could you be designing AI into making us better than we are today, like more compassionate, more thoughtful, because we're more thoughtful in the design than we are in our actual actions in the world? This is an interesting idea. So, And like everybody yeah. talks about AI, right? It's bad. My thing is like, how do you make sure the people designing AI are good people, right? That's, yes, that's what I'm exactly. saying, right? Yes. Are we going to get, you know, some, you know, psychopath designer, you know, who... There's plenty of those. Yeah, yeah and there is, you know, or like, how do we stop that, right? Yeah. To me, it's not right. the design, it's like, who, like, how do we make sure the people designing it are like good people, so to speak, right? And of course, yes. good means different things and different and things, you know. And that's the challenge, yes, And it's exactly. like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to design this AI to, you know, make sure people who have like, you know, stutter have a better ability, right? Right. Or something else, right? It's just... Exactly. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a rapidly changing and evolving world. And uh, and I know that that causes some anxiety for people, but um, uh, well, for all of us, really, I think. That, and at the end of the day, there's nothing you can do to change, to, to stop the progress yeah. or to stop the movement. And so then how can you participate in making things better? I think yeah, that's I, always I kind of joke question. around, like, you know, if Skynet does come, we all know to blame Sam, Sam Altman. The CEO of OpenAI. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if Sinek comes, he, you go get, put Sam Allman in, you know, yeah. he, he's the only responsible. He let it all loose. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. And when we talk about um, going back a little bit to the grit factor, and I'm going to bring this right back to AI, don't worry. Uh, and then the anxiety around it, but the grit factor, as I started to interview these, these leaders in the vanguards of their fields, which really was the development of the grit factor. And then the courses at the grit Institute that we deploy at companies, we deploy them at schools, right? Is uh, there are three parts of the grit triad. And we look at commit, learn, and launch. And commit is this owning your past, like owning your story, connecting to your core purpose. That's all internal work. And that is internal work that you can do without any external influences. And so to the degree that there are external influences that you can't control, you come back to what you can control. And that is that commit phase of the grit factor. The uh, the learn and the launch are, are two other phases of deep engagement in the present. And there's building your team and active listening and there's mindset. And then this launch phase is grounded in the past, deeply engaged in the present, looking towards the future with that audacity, the willingness to take risks, authenticity and adaptability. So the adaptability is is the crux, right? We have to be able to be adaptable because the world is changing so quickly. But when we have anxiety around that change, we come back to that commit phase. It's chapter one and chapter two of the grip factor. There's a whole course on paths to purpose because that phase is so important. And the studies are really clear that people who are individually connected to their purpose, their own individual purpose, have greater longevity in a job and they do better, their performance is better and their engagement is higher. And that's pretty spectacular. Is The Grit Factor the only book you've written? No. So uh, North of Hope is my first book, and uh, it's a much more personal book. It's a memoir of a trip in Arctic, Alaska, which we can speak more to if you like. It certainly has a grit as a large component of it. And then I have a book of essays as well called Where the Wild Gets Inside. So do you consider yourself a professional writer? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And like, how's it, do you, do you, are you a professional writer because you say you are, or is like a certification you have to get, or like? Do you have to sign a number of books or just like I'm a personal writer? I think you have to decide that you're a writer because you write, okay. you know, and um, I, I'm lucky that I've I've traditionally published two books and uh, I think there are many, many, many more to come. And it's what I've always wanted to do. It's been, that is my story when I go back to the commit phase of the grit factor, right? And of that grit triad, the commit phase is what is my story? Well, my story is I always wanted to be a writer. That's what I've wanted to do since I was 12 years old. Can you explain your book writing process? How does it work? Like, do you spend an hour every day writing or doing drafts or like how's that come all together, you know, and then, yeah. And then how you like present it to a publisher or, you know, the whole process. So I have a, I have a uh, video recommending first steps for people who want to write on my YouTube channel at the grit Institute, not under Shannon Paulson, but under the grit Institute, um, because I get asked this question a lot and, um, writing is a question of sitting your tail down in a seat and doing the work. And doing it every day. And then just again, like whether you're a veteran transitioning from the military or whether you're somebody who's picking up pickleball, right? Like what are the ways that you get better at something? Well, you look for external ways to learn. Um, you model yourself after people who do a really good job. So you read a lot all the time and you read really good books. You don't read the trash. I, I will not, like if something's not written well, I literally just, I'm like allergic to it because I'm terrified I'm gonna like pick it up. And so you read good books, you analyze those books, you take classes, you join writing groups, and then you sit your tail down every single day and you write. And uh, And the writing might be, you know, thinking, it might be editing, it might be organizing, it might be actually doing the writing itself. Um, but you take it as it comes and you sit down every single day and you do that work where, when and where you can. Ideally, of course, if you don't have children and you can sit down at the same time in the same place every day, that's great. Whenever I hear that advice, I'm like, those people do not have children because <laughs> this is not possible in my life uh, right now, but uh, maybe after college it will be. And you also do poetry too, right? Yes, I do. You write about poetry. The, your poetry writing, like, is that just part of your creative process you do for fun or? Yeah. Do you have a book of poems out there? I don't have a book of poetry yet. I aspire to. Um, I write it because I love it. Um, and I usually write it when I have been reading more poetry and, and been more inspired that way. I think poetry more than any other form of writing for me requires me to really slow down, like completely stop and and block out what's external. And um, and that's the beauty of of writing well, is that you do stop and block things out and really focus in on on what's important right now. What's your next book that you're going to write? So I right now have a proposal that uh, will hopefully start to pitch this fall. And that is the part of getting a publisher, right? And, uh, you know, I, I do want to say that for anyone who wants to write, there's many ways to write. There's many ways to publish. The way that I am choosing to publish is the traditional form. There are many people who would say that that form is dead and you should just self-publish and that's fine. Um, I still find 
value in the traditional publishing process. And um, this next book is looking at facing the wind. It's looking at courage. It's looking at how it is that we can get stuff done against all of the forces that tell us that we can't. And there are always more of those and there are those that support you. So so this next question might get blasted by some people, but it's my opinion. I think too many people leave the military yeah. who are not good leaders mm. and they become leadership coaches. Like a lot of these people get in the military yeah. and they There's can't- There's some leadership coaches right now, it's right? Like, I, I swear I get at least two or three emails or LinkedIn message a day from people like random places. Yes. Say, I'm a military veteran too. Can I be a coach? I mean, of course, it's more detailed than that. You know, like, yeah, I don't know you. I don't, what makes you like- Right. And just pay people like, like, of course, there's like people, like there's a guy named- um, I think his name is uh, Thomas Smith. He does like, uh, there's a thing called um, something traverse where he takes like CEOs and takes them to Montana. Ah, okay. Yes. There's, there's a couple of wonderful programs like, like that, that actually. You know, yeah. I just too many people like, oh, I'm a um, retired, whatever, you know, I know about leadership. Yes. And then they're like, I'm going I'm to charge, uh, come like $25,000 a day, right? Something yeah. insane, right? Like, right. And of course right. you can't say, you know, maybe passionate about it, you know, you can't tell them not to do it, but man, it's like, it has to be something like, do we really need another? Military veteran leads with her. I don't know. I don't know either. I, you know, I had somebody ask me uh, in another realm of life recently about somebody that they were evaluating for a position um, who presented themselves with great confidence. And I said, you know, look at the track record. Do they have a track record of success? If they have a track record of success doing the thing that you want them to do, if they do, great. I mean, in this case, they did not, right? They presented themselves like, hey, I'm I'm applying for this position and to do this thing. That's this pretty significant role. And they had no track record of success. And, and that is something, as I think about encouraging companies to hire veterans, for example, and encouraging veterans to, to promote themselves and have the confidence to um, to be able to present their experiences in a way that are attractive to companies, I, I, you don't have to have the specific skills, right? I just ran a LinkedIn poll on this. I'm like, do you hire for the skills or yes, the mindset, most, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So so most people hire for the mindset. I would say you don't have to have the specific skills, but you do need a track record of success. And the places that I have made mistakes, and this is whether it's the corporate world or seen mistakes made or the nonprofit world when I you know, we worked recently on a library that we built out in our community, which was an incredible opportunity, but, um, uh, and it's hard, but there are people that are confident in themselves that may have no idea what they're talking about. And so you've got to look for people to be part of a team who have a track record of success, full stop. And in something, right? And in something. And then you can teach them the job. If, if they have a great mindset, they're great learners, they've shown how they can overcome obstacles and learn new things, and they have accomplished things, actually finish them on their own, uh, then they could be a great candidate, even if they have no skills for the job that you're hiring for. But that track record of success is important. And I would say the same for any potential leadership coach. Like, what is their actual track record of yeah. success? And um, I don't know how many of them, what, what they would answer. But there's some that could have great answers and there's some that won't. Yeah, for me, it's like I get yeah. emails all the time from leadership coaches, financial <laughs> advisors, and lead generation. Right. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Like stop the madness, please. <laughs> stop the madness. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Financial advisors. I always think like, if I don't know you, I'm yeah. not likely especially, to hire you. Especially you like, <laughs> like in some random place like North Dakota or Montana or Chicago, right? Like, right. Right. At least being Seattle or. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or no. Some, yeah. If or I have from... no personal reference, we're not probably going to hire you. Right. Like I think people need to be a little smarter about their LinkedIn reach outs too. I think, to be honest, I think there's just been this huge this massive surge of reach outs that are cold and sometimes they're relevant, but they're usually not. I'm like, well, are you just, are you just sending this to everybody yeah. that you're connected to? And that doesn't make any sense. And that makes me not want to work with you because you haven't been thoughtful about that, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So talking about LinkedIn posts, you did a post a while ago where you highlighted uh, one of your coochies. Yes. Yeah. Mike Cameron. Yeah. yeah. Mike Cameron is awesome. He's actually lives in Washington. I haven't met up with him yet, but he's a, I think he's still a ranger in the Olympic national park. Um, yeah. Mike was the crew chief for my first Apache uh, that I flew at tail number two, four, eight. Cause you never forget your first Apache. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and what I, I talk about Mike all the time because Mike was an E4. And, you know, we uh, talk about leadership as officers or non-commissioned officers, right? But he was the E4, so he didn't have anybody reporting to him. He didn't, his whole job was to just do the 10-hour inspections on tail number 248 and launch us. That was, that's what an E4 does. And So basically, the crew chief, for the, no, he, they're, they're responsible for the, air, the, the airframe, right? Yes. They're responsible for everything involved in the airframe, mm -hmm. the maintenance, the fuel, like he's, that's his job. You depend on him 
Yes. You know, you're not dependent on the approval colonel or battalion commander for your flight. You know, no. Or the one officer or the IP. It's this E4. Exactly. The and, soldier. Yeah. Who can never fly in the Apache, by the way. Like the, the crew chiefs for a Blackhawk or a Chinook get to fly all the time. Ours, ours never get to fly because there's two seats in the Apache, right? They're tandem seated like a fighter jet and uh, there's no room for a crew chief. So they never get to fly, but he's responsible for the aircraft. And, or she. Or does that, I think that doesn't make it harder, right? Because if you're a crew chief from Blackhawk, you're on the Blackhawk. Oh, shit. That doesn't sound right. Yeah. Or this doesn't do right. Let me fix it right now. Where yeah. you're a crew chief for Apache, like it takes off. It's, it, 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 unless you come back to hey crew chief yeah this doesn't feel right you know right right big, right big big difference he's not on it right or she's not on it and my other best crew chief by the way was a female um sue harris in another battalion but but mike cameron took such pride in his work and such uh, had such a sense of responsibility in what he did and the example that i give and it seems like a small thing but it, when you've worked around soldiers and you've worked around these things long enough, you know, this is not a small thing. But I remember one time going out to the aircraft to launch and it was our job. I think it's different in other services, but in the army, we needed to untie the aircraft and do the pre-flight check. And then we get in and we take off and there's a crew chief out there just with the, you know, there's a fire extinguisher. They've got their eye protection on and their hearing protection on and they make sure you get off. And so we walked out to the aircraft. Mike had already untied it, unchained it, basically got it all ready for us. We did our pre-flight. And then we start the run-up procedure. And as we turn on the APU, get the rotor blades are starting to turn. And he comes back up to the aircraft, pops open the door to the engine, and is just looking at the, not the engine, sorry, the transmission. And he's looking at the transmission deck to see if there's any kind of a leak on it. He wipes it down, just watches for leaks. I mean, it was a kind of attention to detail that he was not expected to have. Like he was too junior to have, to be expected for that. But he didn't limit himself by the lack of other people's expectations, if that makes sense. And I think that's a really important thing for all of us. Don't let yourself be limited by somebody else's lack of imagination. He held himself to the highest possible standard. And in doing that, he set the example for all of us. And that was not just me as his platoon leader, but it was the whole company. Ultimately, he was known throughout the regiment because he had such attention to detail and such pride in his work. And that is where, when I talk about leading from any seat, right? You can lead from any seat you sit in. You might be the janitor, you might be the admin. You can have a significant diff uh, a significant impact on a culture, on a company, because of your commitment to excellence. I remember many times when I was an officer, like, you know, I would like purposely go this way, like a certain E4. Like I know the E4, he was like the de facto leader of everyone, right? Yeah. Like, like you know, I mean, so a lot of times you're like, you need the in input and feedback from the E4 versus like someone above you, right? Yeah. Because I, if, right. I, if I get the feedback, if I get buy from the E4, you're going to invest all his friends to follow me, right? Yes. And I thought people don't get that wrong, right? Even especially in civilian award, they, they think, oh, I only need an impact from the HR clerk or this admin person or the lowly marketing person, right? Right. And yeah, yeah, yeah. opportunity, right? Because they're the de facto leaders a lot of times. Oh, for sure. No, there's no question. And I will just, because I don't um, give him enough credit and he gets all the credit. My first platoon sergeant when I was a platoon leader was uh, Andy Couturier, and he was the best NCO that you could possibly hope for. And, you know, he would push me hard on things if I would say, hey, we need to do this. And he might push back really hard, but it was always in private. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't, if I, if we stuck with the original course of action, he would march down the stairs and pretend like it was his idea and they would follow him anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. The soldiers would. So at the, that was the relationship that was so important. And I learned so much from Andy. I called him Sergeant C, yeah. but, uh, but he was the, the, the best platoon sergeant you could hope for. And as a young Lieutenant, if you work for a great battalion commander and you have a great platoon sergeant, you are so incredibly lucky. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just so, so many blessed. Of people have Harvard battalion commanders, oh. people saw major Harvard platoon sergeants and like, and yeah, yeah. Set up for failure. You're set up for failure, right? No, I was incredibly blessed with the people that I was. I will say, my second platoon sergeant suffered as a result because he was not very good, mm -hmm. and I had seen what yeah, excellent was, yeah. and so I was like, "Look, this is this is not gonna this isn't gonna cut it," yeah. and uh, that was tough. So, um, there's you know, we've got can to, you talk got about to... this? Can you talk about the connection you make the army? Because like you know, you have the great connection to E4, yeah. Chief. I think a lot of people in the Supreme don't get that. They use like you're like a. VP or something, you know, I can have a, a relationship with some like random officer worker, right? Right. Can you talk about how some like I think the army actually does good, you know? Like I have a lot of friends post military, like work for me, work with, you know, different ranks things. Yeah. Can you just talk about the whole process, how that works in the military. Yeah, I think there are there's the opportunity to have these bonds that are that are significant because you're you're working towards a common mission that is bigger than yourself, right? And one of the things that I think is so compelling, and it's why I designed an entire course on, it's chapter two of the grit factor, but it's blown out. It's much bigger on purpose because 
you know, in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that everybody likes to quote, and this, there's this pyramid, right? And there's like food and shelter at the bottom. And um, the first of all, it's not his hierarchy. Like it's it's not his his pyramid. <laughs> he didn't actually design that. It was it was designed by a consultant. So it's it's usually misattributed. But the other thing that is not usually commented on is that at the at the top of that pyramid, when Maslow late in his life said that self transcendence was the height. It wasn't. It wasn't just getting to the the peak of your expression. It was self transcendence, getting beyond the self, and that is what we have, or we have the opportunity to have, in a place like the military. Is that we're working for something bigger than ourselves, and when you're working together for something bigger than yourself, there's um there is there's a particular bond. That means you're working harder. You stay later. You know, I I remember um, and I don't want to speak badly about anybody, but I remember uh, or groups of people because there are wonderful people committed in many ways, and there's reasons for different organizations. But I remember I have been a professional or semi-professional choral singer for a lot of my adult life, and I was singing with the Seattle Symphony Chorale. We were singing, uh, I think it was the Mozart Requiem, and the chorale, you know, the the orchestra is unionized. The chorale is not. We're just volunteer singers, right? And uh, pretty good ones, but you know, still volunteers. But because the orchestra is unionized, like when when it gets to nine o'clock and the rehearsal is scheduled from seven to nine, they are packing their cases at nine o'clock. The chorus doesn't do that. The chorus stays until you get it right. You know, and I kind of feel like that's what we were in the military. We like stayed till we got it right. And that meant we stayed late and that meant we worked weekends. And you, I, I just have, I have a hard time when I come up against that. And again, I don't want to use that specific example farther than it should go because there's reasons for, for unions and there's reasons for people being treated well and being paid enough. So, so please let that just stand as a, as a partial comment. But, um, but in general, when I have worked on projects and people are like, well, I, I don't do that. Like, that's too much for me to do. And I'm like, we're not on the right team. Like this, this is not, we're not, this is not going to work because if, if I'm going to be on a team with somebody, we're going to get stuff done. And we're going to do whatever needs to happen to get stuff done. And where I have made mistakes in the past is when I have been on teams where that is not a shared mission. And I think that's a special thing in the military. In many cases, not in all cases, the military is a huge place, right? Um, but when it's good, we're on the same team and we're here to get stuff done. And that means we're going to do what it takes and we're going to support each other to do that. I think it's a yeah. challenge now, like in, in, this is very important in the military too, maybe like this is my, my experience, right? Army, post-army, every organization I've been at, there's like 80% of the people are like, you know, um, you pay, you only pay me $30 an hour. Yeah. All you can do with this, you know, and that's it, right? The other 20% are like, you pay me $30 an hour. Oh my God, I got to do what I do to make sure I'm valued with you. Right? Yes. Yes. And then the 80% get mad and wonder why the 20% are getting promoted, getting raises and stuff, you know, it's just a mentality. Now, now of course, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to get paid with your words, you of know, course. things off. But like, yes. I just see too many people like, you know, oh, I'm only getting this. I'm only doing this. I'm only, you know, and like, I've got themselves. no patience for that. I, my, my, I remember, so my family comes from the Midwest originally. So we're very, although I grew up in Alaska, my family's from the Midwest and from Kansas, actually. And I remember my grandfather, my dad's dad said that um, if you get paid 25 cents an hour to scrub toilets, you better earn every single one of those 25 cents. Like you better do your best job. And you want to know what, if you, if you do that, you're going to be noticed and you're going to be promoted and you're going to do better. If yeah. you're the one that sits back and is like, well, I did my 25 cents worth. I'm done for now. I'm like, you're going nowhere. Yeah. You're going nowhere fast. And, and you're it, just going to be a cop. You're just going to yeah. be a cop. And it's first yeah. thing that people don't see that. Right. Right. I mean, you, you hold yourself to, to excellence. Like Mike Cameron, right. He's an E4. He wasn't getting paid anything obviously yeah. as an E4. Right. And, and he held himself to a standard of excellence where that guy's going to do, he could do yeah. anything. So I would he, hire him over any, almost anyone else I've ever worked with. It was easily doing the work of E6 easily. So. Oh, yeah, at least, at yeah. least. Yeah. No, he was absolutely incredible. So yeah, you hold yourself to a higher standard and you'll also be more proud of yourself, yeah. right? Like have pride in your work for goodness sakes. And if you don't, I mean, yeah. That, I don't know what else, I don't have a lot to say. I, I don't have a lot of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Take pride in your work and then demand what you're worth. But you yeah. do have to earn it first. And I do hear from employers sometimes like, hey, we get these young people in and they think they're going to be CEO tomorrow. And it's like, no, you got to, it's both kind of paying your dues. You've got to get experience. You've got to show that you can have a track record of success, that you can contribute meaningfully and that you can learn as you go. And once you've done that, then start having those conversations. But um, if you don't do that, I... Yeah, I'm, I don't have a lot of time for that. Yeah, I'm with you. So next, <laughs> talk about how you determine your speaking fees 
And what kind of speaking engagements you look to have? Like, how do you say yeah. yes to potentially speaking engagement or say no? So right now, and the, as I'm building up the Grit Institute, I hope that this will change. But at the moment, speaking is my primary revenue source. And so um, when I started to speak, I you speak for free initially. And I also have a video on my YouTube channel at the Grit Institute uh, where I talk about this, by the way, for people who are aspiring speakers. But you speak for free and you have to build up your tape, your 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 videotape that kind of shows you doing your thing so that people can see what they're hiring. Uh, and then you start asking around and you start saying, okay, I've been doing this for three years now. Here's somebody else doing it for three years. Try to get a sense. It's hard to kind of know sometimes what people charge, but you can kind of look around. Um, and then I worked for an agency exclusively for a while and they were able to increase my fees pretty significantly. And then you keep kind of doing comparables, you know, like you do with other things. I'll look around, I'll say, okay, this person, I know, uh, I know, what my abilities are, I know how I deliver, and um, and this is where I should be pricing myself. I probably price myself on the low end of the bracket right now, uh, but I'm happy with it, and I also am not willing to do a lot below that because I now know I've been doing this for ten years. I'm I'm really good at what I do. I've spoken around the world to companies uh, of all sizes, from sixty to six thousand people in an audience, and um, and so I also that means don't take a lot of pro bono. I may take a little, a, one or two things a year for bro, pro bono, but then there's an opportunity cost, right? So if I book to do something uh, pro bono for a cause that I care about, it's got to be a cause that I care about that I'm connected to, um, then I can't book something else, right? And it's time away from my family. And so I've started to get pretty careful on what I accept and what I don't accept because I'm not willing to be away from my family more than uh, you know, more than two engagements a month or three engagements a month will allow me to do virtual engagements. Let me do a lot more because I can do more online. But uh, it's a it's a it's a nuanced thing. You kind of figure it out as you go. Of course, you know you see the memes yeah. on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, like your your company makes a billion dollars in profit, but you want me to speak for free. I I find it offensive when people ask me to speak for free. I am now like officially offended. And if there's a place that wants you like, hey, it would be so helpful to have you do this because these people would benefit so much. I'm like, great, go get a sponsor because mm. sponsors will help pay for the fee. Yeah. I mean, so if you're willing to do the work, then I can do the work, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's true for speakers. And at the end of the day, what we're offering is is um, both experience in the art and the craft of it, but also the experience that we have that we can bring to the table. And so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to do that for companies. I'm really grateful that I'm usually found by people. I don't have to go out and look for the business anymore too much. Uh, and um, it's an incredible opportunity. I love speaking to companies. I love the chance to get up there and and share this really transformational information and and the stories that lead into that that those transformational ideas and then ideally bring them into the courses at the grid institute as well because that's where the real transformation can come is the book the keynote and then the courses and that's that's where the magic happens what's an example of a cause you would consider speaking for free for oh come on jason <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not one when that, somebody that you consider. Not, yeah. not, not that you do, you consider. I just had a uh, a military women's group. I won't say which one. Uh, reach out and say, look, our our budget is probably not what your speaking fee is. Um, would you uh, consider speaking on this date for this event? I said, let me know what your budget is, and let me see if I can make it work. It's a military women's group. It's going to be several hundred people. They'll likely buy books for everybody in the audience. And so then, then that's something that we I try to work with because that's something that's clearly like part of my mission is among other things is working with women in leadership and working with veterans transitioning. And so that meets both of those sweet spots. Um, but I also work with sales groups and I also work with C-suite groups and I work with anybody who's like trying to get over a hurdle, whether it's growing so quickly that it's really hard to keep a company culture together or whether it's that they're really running into a lot of tough spots. So it's all of those things, but if it hits one of those sweet spots, then that may be something that um, that I'll consider. And of course, that's going to be probably depends. But on average, how many speaking gigs do you do per month? Yeah, I try. I won't travel more than twice a month. Okay. So, um, but I will do more if they're vir virtual. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I average about probably twenty to twenty-two a year, and I purposely okay. keep that low. So because I again, which is also why I'm not going to take something for for less than what I what yeah. I speak for because I I I can command that, um and uh, and I'm not willing to be away from my family for less than that. It's not worth it. Do you have like a a bucket list speaking engagement like you want to do like you know speak the Madison Square Garden in front of uh, IBM executives uh, or like you know? I want to do a TED talk. Okay. I want to do a TED talk. That's so that's something, done, right? I'm surprised you haven't done one. I know. I don't know actually why I haven't done one, but I'm going to try. I will prioritize okay. that in the next year or so as as uh, to get on the TED stage. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's like maybe anything speaking from the, you know, U S military aviation industry, you know, something like that, or I don't know. I 
really thought about it that way, to be honest. That's a really interesting uh, question. Um, yeah, I, I, so I don't think I have an answer for that. I, I, I really enjoy the opportunity to speak to literally like every industry that you can think about. So like from managers at In-N-Out Burger to, you know, the, 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 the chemical industry to finance to the meat industry to produce i mean like literally anything that you can name uh, the packaging industry right i mean this these principles of grit and resilience and looking at it in a holistic way that we do in the grit triad this commit learn and launch it applies frankly to everybody and and of course the way that I address each different group is different depending on the levels of the people that are attending and what they want to get out of the conference. So is the um, preparation different based on the groups? And, oh, for and sure. The size yeah, of people you're talking to? absolutely. Yes. And I end up going over it. Oh my gosh, so many times. And I look at the industry trends and I look at their company trends and we have conferences before or calls before the conference so that I understand, hey, what do you want your people to come away with? I ask them, you know, are there keywords that you want me to use? Are there things that you want to celebrate? Are there things that you don't want me to mention, you know? And so once I have that, I can craft it specifically for them. I always think of every single keynote as being specifically for that customer and that client. And that's really important to me. I, I've heard from others that that's not always the case with keynote speakers. And I'm grateful that I can connect to clients in that way. But I love business and I love business challenges and problems. So when I can make this grit triad apply, it's 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 magic. So when you do your yeah. keynote, obviously you rehearse part. You have to find out somewhere like, like you do rehearsal, like you want to hear your points. Uh -huh. And you give the actual speech, you're like, you say the same thing, but not in the same way, you know, if that makes any sense. Exactly. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Because it's going to be different depending on the client, depending on the circumstance, depending on the day, depending on how the audience reacts to you and uh, whether they think something is funny or not, or whether they get into one story and they're really engaged or not. And so, yeah, it's, they're different every single time. And, uh, and that's part of the fun of it. So what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Oh, gosh. I read a lot. Um, I like to paint. I like to play piano. Uh, my family and I backpack quite a bit and hike quite a bit, mountain bike, road bike. Um, is that pretty much it? I, I run after my two boys all the time. I mean, my gosh, they keep us very busy. Uh, and, and I think my work is fun, honestly. Like I, I just listened to a, uh, an interview with Seth Godin. He's like, it's not work-life balance. It's like life. It's life. And I think that's about right. I think that's about right. We also just got back from a year in France. We lived overseas for the past year and um, travel is very much something that I love. And so now I'm working on my French as well. And uh, and so I think that's fun too. You too, do you, do you still skydive? I don't still skydive. No, I still have my parachute, but I'm quite sure no one would want to jump it since it's well, not been jumped in 20 years. So yeah, it's been like that long since you skydive? It's been that long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it in college and in the military. Um, I jumped, let's see, where did I jump? I jumped in Scotland and North Carolina. Didn't I jump somewhere else? Um, anyway, I, I loved skydiving. It was a ton of fun. And I would do it again. I'd go up and skydive. When my kids are ready to go jump out of an airplane, I'll go do another tandem with them and it'll be fun. Then how about yeah. scuba diving? Yeah. Still, do, still doing that? No, but again, when my kids are old enough, I think it'll be a ton of fun to do again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've snorkeled with them, but they're 10 and 13. So they're still just shy of kind of, I guess you could probably scuba dive at this point. Probably Pretty so. soon they'll be ready. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about I think it's called paths to purpose. Yeah. 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 Paths to purpose. I designed paths to purpose um, when in the midst of the pandemic, and I was working with clients. You know, we kind of had this this huge shock around the world, and then we sort of didn't do anything for a while, and then we went virtual. And and as I was talking to clients, I was hearing again and again the need for this, 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 there was this lack of connection to purpose. There was a need to connect to purpose. And then the McKinsey studies came out as well that supported the same thing. So the McKinsey studies came out and they said, you know, if when individuals are connected to their own sense of purpose, not the company's purpose, right? Not what the military does really well, but their own internal sense of purpose, they stay at a job longer, directly relevant to the great resignation, right? And all of the exodus from jobs, they stay at a job longer they have much higher engagement. And right now we have at least 65% of people unengaged from work, right? Completely disengaged or, or not engaged. And they have better performance, which of course makes sense. They also show higher scores in meaning for both work and life, which is relevant to their physical health and their mental and emotional health. And so I was like, there is this thing around purpose. And I feel connected to this idea of purpose because that's what I sort of started to lose at some point in the military and and, and lost in the corporate world. And so how do you help people get to this place? 
And I talk in my keynotes about the five whys. And I walk people through that. And that is part of the paths to purpose as well. It's like drilling down from to something that is agnostic of the organization and agnostic of the job specifically to say, hey, this is my purpose. You know, and I, I give the example of myself in the military and how I could connect to service. The idea of serving something bigger than myself, right? And serving people in a different way, a meaningful way. But then I realized like, well, why did that not work for me then to stay in the military? Like if I was connected to that, I still left. So then I started to explore the idea of purpose. And I looked at the ways that people do it in different um, different cultures and at different points in different cultures around the world. And so I developed a training that is called Paths to Purpose. There's probably a book that'll come from this too, I imagine. Uh, and we look really at going deeper into owning your own story because that's really the opportunity and the responsibility every one of us have is to take this raw material of our life that we're given, whether we ask for it or not, and shape it in the direction that we want to go. We, we all have that opportunity. We don't all take that opportunity. But then it's connecting to purpose, both in this discrete and specific way, but also looking at broader and more nuanced ways. And so Paths to Purpose takes you through owning your story and then four different ways to connect to your own purpose, both specific and more general. And then at the very end of trainings at the GRIT Institute, we have an activate and integrate stage, which is to say, now you've done this work. You've done all this work in this last you know, five weeks. How can you take this into your daily or weekly goal setting and assessment and take this to your manager or your mentor or your teacher or your coach and say, this is what I'm working on. Will you help me work on that as well? Because the adult learning model shows that we learn 10% of what we do formally, 20% through our manager and our mentor, and 70% is through what we do in our own life and work. And so I wanted to be able to take that activate and integrate stage to say, here's all this work that we've done on purpose. How do you now bring this into your life in a practical way that lets you really go deep into it? So I'm super excited about it. I've run it at the Tuck School at Dartmouth at Intuit. Um, we ran it through Ver at the legal department at Verizon, and um, it's it's a super super powerful program. It's been amazing to see transformation from it. How do you get people like folks are like, I don't need a purpose. I don't, this is a malarkey. How do you influence them to convince them? No, this is actually good for you. Well, part of it is just looking at the evidence, right, and looking at the studies. And 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 at the end of the day, you can't convince anybody anything, right? They have to decide it for themselves. And there was one lady in a company once who's like, well, do I need a higher purpose? Like, I just really want to like make a lot of money so I can buy a big boat. And I was like, cool. Like that's your purpose right now. Most people usually find by the end of their lives that that's not adequate as a purpose, but if that works for you now, that's great. And then like, keep asking yourselves these questions because all of the data and all of the anecdotal evidence as well is pretty strong on the idea that, that we all need to connect to, to a larger reality, to a bigger reality, to a bigger sense of purpose. And um, and I would also caveat that because there are people who use that argument to do bad things, uh, that you should also make sure that whatever purpose you connect yourself to meets the criteria of first do no harm, right? Um, so if you have people telling you to, I'm gonna get political really quickly, say storm the Capitol, that's a bad idea. That's not the right purpose, right? So find another way to live your purpose and um, first do no harm and connect to something bigger than yourself. So talk about your role. I think you just took on as the um, at the tech school of business at Dartmouth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you? What's that all about? So I've I, so that's I attended the tech school after I left the military, and I'm incredibly grateful for those two years because again, not always being graceful in my transitions. So this is my ignorance. Where is Dartmouth at? Yeah. Yeah. It's in New Hampshire. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah. So it's two hours north of Boston in New Hampshire. Uh, Dartmouth College is an undergraduate school, but there's also many graduate programs as well. So the tech school has been around for a really long time. Um, uh, business management and leadership program, kind of general management. It's known for its very strong cohort and connection among its students, uh, which I certainly experienced myself. I met my husband there. I have some best friends from there. So, uh, and it's um, it's a mix of case study and hands-on, um, very kind of uh, tactical learning. So the case study appealed to me, which is like, here's a business problem. Let's solve this, you know, via discussion conversation using these principles and tools that we know, but you also still learn capital markets and accounting and all that kind of thing. So um, I now teach at the Tuck School's executive education program for leadership and strategic impact. And that is every spring and every fall, there's a cohort that comes through for a week and they have a number of different courses. And I'm really grateful that I've just started actually working with them this last spring, but it's a fabulous group and always super motivated people. They're usually senior at a company kind of preparing for the C-suite that kind of that that level where they've been around for a while, they've done a lot, and now they're going back to really solidify 
ideas, but also connect to their own personal leadership and develop that leadership so they're ready for the next step. And this is virtual in person? No, it's in person. Yeah. So I get to go back to Hanover twice a year, which is oh, awesome. Wow. Nice. And spring and fall is like the perfect time. So, yeah. So you met your husband at Dartmouth? I did. So yes. he has, do you have any military background or? No. So how did that work a lot? How that work? Like, no, a lot of military people, they marry military people. So yeah. The same culture. How that works for like, you know, military culture, all you think you had to go through and like, yeah. Him being like, you know. He's yes. an amazing guy. Yeah. I would just say that. Right. I remember my backseater, um, Matt, who I flew with in Bosnia and he's like, LT, you're just going to be so out of luck. Cause there is no guy that's going to want to date some girl that's done cooler stuff than he's done. <laughs> used other words than that, but yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, my husband's awesome. He's amazing. He's own, we're great partners in this whole like marriage and life business. And that's a big, big deal. Um, he has always supported, um, my, my doing whatever it is that I want to do. So that's um, a really big thing. His dad was military. So okay, his dad, some kind of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. His dad was a Marine. I say was because he's passed away now, um, two years ago, but his dad is a Marine at end of world war two and Korea actually. And so really had a strong identity with the Marines. And so it's, um, it's, a, so has there been a time like at the dinner table, or like your dad, like your husband was telling the kids, I just really cool thing. You're like, yeah, I don't know about that. This, this guy is way cooler. So, so this guy is way cooler. You dad talking about? Well, you know, it's a pretty cool stuff. He, we both. I mean, fortunately, we both married late. So we married when we were thirty-five, uh -huh. and um, later than most people. Neither one of us had been married before, uh -huh. and had kids. Obviously, later than that, or maybe not obviously, but later than that. And uh, both of us had traveled all over the world. He traveled in, you know, Nepal and South America, and um, he did a semester overseas in Africa. And like, he's 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 done his stuff, okay. you know. And um, I don't think I would be interested in somebody who hadn't at least <laughs> gotten out gotten outside the state once or twice yeah. so no he, he's had a, a, a fascinating life and we are I think uh, of the same mind of wanting to build that that same kind of life of adventure for ourselves and for our children and that was part of the impetus for going to France for the last year so here's a question for you yeah like obviously you and your husband want to be great parents right but you've done great mm -hmm. things your husband done great things it, does that put too much pressure on your kids like meet the same level of excellence like how does that work our kids just think we're, you know, schmucky parents. I, we're not yeah. interesting to them at all. Yeah. Uh, but um, I don't know. I mean, I I have high standards for our children. I think, and 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 my husband Peter does too. Um, but I think that's just who we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether that puts too much pressure, I don't know. My, I mean, our first kid just wants to. He wants to start a business. He wants to like. He raised ten thousand dollars for World Central Kitchen for Ukraine last year on his own. Um, he's just like on his, he's on fire. And uh, the other one, <laughs> the other one doesn't want us to tell him anything. So I don't know. I, yeah, I, we have high standards, but I think that means that we love them. And, um, and that's how I grew up. And I think uh, we're of the same similar mind that that's going to set them up for success in their lives. Your challenge for your kid might be in the future, like, you know, like they're doing something right. And somebody may say, is your mother the first Apache pilot? Like, what are you doing? Right. Like, you know, <laughs> you're not, you're not mean your, your parents standard, like do better, you know? Yeah, I feel like uh, in general, society puts too little pressure on kids right now. I think so. Okay. I think that's going to be probably a highly controversial statement, but I think there's this, it depends on which sector you're in. It yeah. actually totally depends. We live out in the boonies, you know, there's one school anywhere around. Um, and but people are like, oh, don't don't be too tough on them. I'm like, really? So, I mean, kids are tough and kids are resilient, and they actually, frankly, need a little grit and resilience, right? And so, like, we took them to France last year. They went into a public school in France. They did not speak French. It was hard, yeah. and it was really hard. And the French teachers aren't known for being very gentle. In yeah. fact, they're sort of the opposite. Uh, our youngest kid had a really tough time, and you know what? They're tougher for it. I don't think it was. It's not. It wasn't abusive. It was just. It was no, hard. Yeah. It was hard, right? And. Um, and at the same time, they had Ukrainian classmates who had fathers or brothers fighting in Ukraine and were, live, you know, both taking school in French, but also going home and doing Ukrainian school while their father's fighting in Ukraine. Yeah. And I was like, you want to know who's got it tough? Yeah. That kid's got yeah. it tough. Yeah. And I think it was a helpful perspective for them and, and for all of us. So I think obviously we have to take care of our children. Obviously there is a mental health crisis right now across our country and adults and children. All of those are, are real and we have to take care of that. And at the same time, taking care of that doesn't mean not having standards. Yeah. So there's a balance and there's, um, yeah, there's a balance. So I'm yeah. guessing if one of your kids bought home a participation, participation trophy, you probably throw away in the trash. I wouldn't throw it away. I just say, <laughs> great. How are you going to get better? You know? <laughs>
<laughs> like, but we're pretty strict. I mean, we have two boys. We don't do video games in our house. Um, there are no phones. I mean, there's they're 13 and 10. We said, we'll talk about it when they're 16. And we're not going to change that. I mean, that is what it is. And, you know, there's all these parents that'll say, oh, we have to do it because all their friends have it. I'm like, really? I mean, you're the parent. Yeah. So no, you don't have to do it. And I, I hear absolutely no data to support uh, do it, have, making it another decision. And so I think that is being strong enough in your own convictions that, hey, we're going to be parents in the way that we want to be parents, and we're going to do things the way we want to do, and we're going to have high standards, and that's just how it is. Will they be, they will not always live up to them, but we don't always live up to ours either. And so that is that honest kind of vulnerable conversation that we didn't do so well you know, when I was growing up, my parents never admitted yeah. anything. Yeah. So we try to try to do that better. And I'm sure we, I fail every day as a parent. Yeah. Like so. growing up over the, our parents generation, like you had video proof. Yes. That's not me. Yeah. I say that. Yeah. I yeah. have you on video. Right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So, I, don't from, I never said that. I never did that. <laughs> exactly. Like, That's your right. memories way different what our memories are growing up, you know, like. Yes. Yes. It's true. It's very true. I, I will say in terms of humility that I have never had anything humble me so much as parenting every day. So. So I found yeah. this on your LinkedIn. Hopefully I wrote this down right. So the quote is not, it's not your quote. I think it says God and actually I don't know who it is from, <laughs> but standing still is moving back moving forward into discomfort, into what is not expected, into what is not perhaps accepted is where growth happens. Yes, I, I, that is not Seth Godin. It's, um, oh, he probably says the same thing. I think we all say that uh, if, if we think about it hard enough. But yes, I, I think um, you've got to, you have to keep moving forward. You have to keep pushing yourself and you have to keep learning. And it's that continual learning, continuous improvement that is, um, I think both going to be a hallmark of success for going forward because the world is changing so quickly. You must be continually learning, but it's also got to be fun, right? I think it's um, it's it, it's what life's about is keep learning, keep improving, keep getting better, and um, keep doing better, right? Keep contributing more, and that's the opportunity is what we contribute, what we give back. Do you see yourself ever retiring? No. I mean, yes and no. I, I will probably do different things at different times. I will always write and probably always speak as a result. Um, I think, uh, yeah, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> I, I, not in, and, and maybe also because I work for myself and my husband has said too, he's like, I'm never going to retire. And it's like, should we have talked about this before we got married? Because <laughs> I sort of plan to travel a bit more. But, you know, we can, we can work from wherever in the world. But I, I love engaging my brain. And I think that's... Um, important to me to be able to do. And so I, I cannot ever imagine not doing that. Yeah. So you did an article on Substack and it's called, I think it's called Psychic, Psychic Requirements of Change. Oh yeah. The Psychic Requirements yeah. of Change. Yeah. That was, um so two newsletters ago. So my newsletter is called Facing the Wind. It's on Substack. So you can find it on Substack or you can go through my website and I'll, I'll connect you into it. But um, uh, the Psychic Requirements of Change, we're looking at, at coming back from France and we had this year away uh, it sounds, some people will say, oh, that sounds idyllic. I'm like, well, it was really hard, actually. It was very challenging and it was really incredible. I mean, it was a, it was, oh, and it's been my dream. It's all of those things, right? It was always my dream to live overseas. Um, we, uh, hopefully we'll do it again. But um, coming back, you know, people would ask like, oh, isn't it great to be home? And isn't it great to be back in your house? I'm like, yeah, 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 it's all, that's all true. But I was exhausted when I came home and I was like going to bed at seven or 7.30 and sleeping for like 12 hours. And I was glad that I blocked off a week to kind of settle back in, although there was no settling in. It was really just like recovering, you know, and realizing that when there are major changes and there have been in our world over the last three years and people feel tired and burned out, it's like there is a psychic cost to change. It's also a constant, right? But there is a psychic cost to that. And so there, so how do you work within that environment successfully with that psychic cost um, and, and still be successful? And I think part of that is acknowledging that we need to build rest into our schedules. And that's something I wish I'd added into the grit factor. Cause I always say like grit is critical. It's very nuanced. It's very complicated. It's critical, but it's not a sustainable operating mode. So you have to build rest into your schedule and that's your daily schedule, your weekly schedule, your annual schedule. And then it's also about relationship and that, you know, there's so many great studies out right now that really emphasize this importance. The Harvard grant study is one. There was, um, Bill Gates just had a, uh, one of his first podcasts uh, on his new podcast was talking about the importance of relationship, but those places that go back to this commit phase again of the grit triad, these first few chapters of the grit factor, that's where we find our strength and that's where we find our courage. And, and knowing that change is going to be exhausting at times 
means that we've got to make allowances for that. And that was really the idea behind that, that post. So why in France, what was going on with your house here in Washington? Like, you, did you read it out to someone, Airbnb, or you guys want to come no. check out once in a while? Or? Yeah, we know our neighbors really well. I mean, we live in a small community where people kind of okay. look after each other. Um, my brother came out and stayed there a few times. He lives in Oregon. And um, we rented out, we have a little uh, guest apartment that we rented out uh, for several months over the course of the winter. Mm -hmm. So there was always somebody checking on it and checking okay. in. And my husband is also in technology. He works in fintech. And so he has everything digitalized so we know if there's a water leak or there's okay. something else and so he could let the neighbor know hey we have a we have an indicator that we have a water leak mm -hmm. could you go check on that and the neighbor okay. would check on it and yeah so why france why why, france? why choose france to live for you versus i mean italy germany <laughs> yeah. i mean there's so many great places you could have went to why france yeah and i and i'd love to too um the, we wanted to go to europe and we wanted to go somewhere that we could ski for the season because we're skiers and our kids are competitive Nordic And you skiers. say France, you weren't in Paris. You're like one of the- No, no, no. We're in a little village little in the village. Southeast. Okay. Yeah. So we were outside of Grenoble in a place called the Vercors. It's a, a high mountain plateau. It has about five villages on that high mountain plateau. And the way that we picked it, honestly, was knowing we wanted to go to Europe, knowing that we wanted to um, go somewhere we could ski. And then we, my husband went in to get the kids ski gear from our local mountain shop. And the owners of that local mountain shop are an American Olympic skier uh, named Eric Bjornsson and his wife, who is a French national biathlete uh, named Maureen Doucet. And she said, well, why don't you go to my town? And my parents are here next week and you can meet them. And they, and honestly, it was, it was, it was perfect. So everything it, lined up, so to speak. It lined up. It didn't make it easy, but it made it easier certainly to get settled. And, uh, and it was just a beautiful community. We lived right across from the elementary school. Our other son, you know, just had to walk and, a mile. And how many people live in this town? About 5,000. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So when you got there, it was reacting like, who are these random Americans coming to take over our French town? Like, how dare they come here? No, I mean, the French are, are, are delightful. Everyone but my 10 year old's teacher was delightful and incredibly <laughs> generous. Um, we did not speak French. We worked on it really hard while we were there. My 10 year old now speaks pretty fluently. The 13 year old's decent, and my husband and I are okay. Uh, actually, we're not really okay. We're pretty bad, but we can communicate um, badly. And these people were so incredibly generous and so helpful. And I, I ended up with the, um, there was a women's coffee group that met and spoke in French. There was a women's wine group that met and spoke in English. Uh, there was a little choir that sang, and I have, you know, been singing most of my life, so I sang in the little choir. Um, and just, just a lovely, lovely group of people. Really wonderful. Again, small village, right? Small village in the southeastern Alps, where the tourists are usually French. So it wasn't like Chamonix. With Chamonix, yeah. it's like everyone speaks English, right? Yeah. And Courchevel, everyone speaks English and Russian. And this little village is just French. And that was, that made us learn it. It made us connect into the culture in a more meaningful way. And you'll plan on doing this again in the future, like I would another love place. to. Well, or that place. I mean, I don't know. I, we're going to go back every year, I hope, to that same village and then also continue to explore France. Um, we also, while we were there, we traveled to Italy and um, uh, Switzerland and Turkey and Greece and Morocco. So we we got out as well. And of course, went to Paris, went to yeah. the UK and that. But like, people don't realize how easy it is to travel across Europe. Like, I mean, yeah. you, you can drive anywhere, you can take trains everywhere. It's amazing. They have like Ryanair, like cheap flights. Ryanair you know. is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Came That's how we flight. got to Denmark, actually, and went to the Lego house for came our kids. Flight, yeah. yeah, it's really easy. So how do you encourage or even do you want to encourage like your kids to keep in touch with the friends they made in this country village? Yeah, that's actually a great question because we don't do phones, right? <laughs> um, and actually, those kids didn't have phones either, which was a really nice thing. I, I'm really big on waiting on digital for kids. I think it's really important. Um, so we are writing postcards. So I'm like, hey, why don't you guys sit down and write a postcard? You're going to have to do it in French. You're going to have to take French anyway, so you may as well write it in French. And then we'll go back and visit as well. But that will definitely be something that we work on keeping in touch with people and also encouraging them to as well. Okay. Yeah. And so what advice you have to, for anyone who's the only blank in the room, only female, only black person, only mm. whatever in there, you're the only one in the room, what, what advice you have to them? That is a great question. I think it's really important to find your people. And those people may or may not be in the room, but there will be some of them in the room that are your people, but also to build your team. This is chapter three of the grit factor, by the way. So when you pick it up, you can read about it because we talk about the different types of relationships that you want to make sure that you form. Uh, you'll look for a manager um, or mentor. You'll look for, certainly for mentorship, but there's also, there's always an intimate, right? That might be a spouse or a partner, but it might also be a very close friend. There might be a colleague. So you have your team that you can always rely on uh, to talk through challenges, whether they're tactical or strategic. And that's really, really important. So if you're going into something where you're the minority, I think that's an important uh, first step. 
And then the second thing is remember to connect to your purpose when things are feeling tough. So why am I here? My gosh, like people are acting this way or really are, are, are really difficult. Um, why am I here? Well, I'm here because I'm here to serve or I'm here to, you know, do, do X or Y. Um, the other thing is to, to be willing to be honest with yourself. Like, is there something that I'm doing to make a challenging situation more challenging? Is there something that I could do better? Uh, or or not. And uh, and then lastly, I would say is to communicate. If there is a real challenge, if you're one of the first and there's a real challenge with a colleague or with your boss is sit down and have an honest conversation and say, I just want to, I don't feel like this is going as well as I'd like it to be going, you know, what, how, how can we, how can we do better? Just be very upfront with it. And, um, and you kind of have to feel out each situation. Every situation is different. Every person is different. Every relationship is different, but, um, but, but really work to figure out kind of where it is that, um, you can find those those points of commonality, but more than anything, start with your team. So, how do you take care of yourself, like both mentally and physically? Yeah, um, I, I don't always do a great job of that. I think moms <laughs> moms are notorious for not doing very well at that. I am starting to uh, need to do better because my knees are bothering me and my shoulders bothering me. So I was like, you know, I need to start saying I'm going to block off time for yoga, um, which was never a thing that I did because it wasn't hardcore. Right. Um, and it turns out like once you're over 50, you better start doing yoga after 50, everything's hardcore after 50, everything is hard. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Everything's hardcore. So, um, so that is my goal is to start to block off time to do yoga. Um, because you know, women and men, but especially women, I love lifting weights actually. So I need to start to add that back into the schedule. Um, adding the active time in and then the quiet time in is what I'm, is my goal to do better at, uh, which I don't do very well. And then for me, um, whether it's meditation or prayer, I think it's really important. Prayer is really important to me. So finding that quiet time, um, to, to, to be and to sit and to, um, uh, to be in a different space is also really important. So all of those things I will tell you, I need to do, and none of them I do consistently well right now. So one, one thing, like, like, of course, the younger generation gets a lot of like black, whatever, whatever. Uh, one thing they did well, is like the built your health, right? Like, like me growing up, yeah. if I said, you know, Hey, you know, so do you need to do this? And like, I have to take me on a health day. I like, I'll lose my fucking mind. Right. Like, are you kidding me right now? But, I mean, but it's actually a good thing, right? I mean, yeah. Of course, yeah. I, I think you can't do it all the time, right? I mean, right. everyone needs to reset. I think that's one thing this generation does good. Like, they're like, hey, hold up, you know, yeah. this is too much stress on me, you know. Then yes. again, on the side, like, you know, stress is good for you too, right? Have to be some kind of balance, right, I think. It's always a balance. It, that's the, there's always that tension, right? And that is the thing. But we didn't do enough of that. Oh, no. And maybe there's too much of it happening and we need to find the way to meet in the middle. Um, but but certainly that is too where that honest communication comes up, where if you're a manager of somebody and uh, they need a mental health day, hopefully you're connected with them. So it's not yeah. that surprising. You might even suggest it, say, hey, why don't you take off? you know, take off next week. Like we don't need you in here next week. Yeah. Go just go, go chill, go fishing, go read, go whatever. Um, and, and know that you can, again, like help to anticipate their needs even before they do. But yeah, there is a balance to be, yeah. to be found as well. Of course, you know, the pushback would be like, you know, like you pose, I'm just making this up, you get redeployed, we'll say to, the, to Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah, right? yeah. And I, you're like the leader, right? You're a commander or sergeant major or whatever. Like, man, I'm really feeling down or the best. I need to tap her, right? You can't do that. Because you can't do that. You can't do it. Not when you're the leader. If you're tapped out, your, your career is over with, right? Right, right. There are some, I mean, I think that's too, we're learning. That's why grit and resilience still matters, right? And when people say, oh my God, grit, like, do I just have to suck it up? I'm like, sometimes you do. And, but really grit is a much more holistic understanding. That is, it's, it's not the sustainable operating mode. You give yourself the rest when you need it so that you can go hard, right? So you can train hard, then you rest. Like anyone knows lifting weights, right? I like the analogy and is you don't lift chest every single day because you've got to recover, right? You've got to recover and let your muscles rebuild. Um, or you don't lift back every day. You lift it, you know, every other day or every third day because you've got to let those muscles recover. And the same is true for us. But you do want to push yourself harder and harder so that you get stronger and stronger, yeah. whether it's weightlifting, whether it's leadership, whether it's just pushing through. Yeah. And uh, and there are times when you've got to have built that up where you're going to go all out longer than you think you can. And yeah. then you're going to get stronger for it if you let yourself recover. So it is that balance of of active uh, action and recovery and action and recovery. I mean, even deploy, yeah. you can't work 20 hours a day three and six hours a week. No. I mean, even, I mean, in my unit, no. every time we deployed, two times we deployed to Afghanistan, each unit, like you had to take a day off, right? Yeah, I mean, right. It's like, right. And then like one one group, like the great command, like you walked in, like, what, what are you doing here? Right, exactly. Yeah. I remember there were um, a few field grade... <laughs> 
officers when I was a younger officer that we would watch and they would not sleep, right? Because they weren't flying missions. So they would, and they thought they were tough because at the time, I like, I'm sure they're smarter now, but at the time they thought that if they just didn't sleep for like the entire four day FTX, they were cool or they were tough or they were whatever Not and more. complete morons yeah. after like 20 hours. And everybody De- was like, the yeah. Speaking. And I remember the regimental commander coming down once and commanding the field grade officers at the battalion level to go to bed. And I'm like, this is absurd. Like, yeah. this is just stupidity. Yeah. And, and it wasn't even war. Like if it was war, it would be one thing. Right. But it wasn't, it was an FTX. And so field training exercise for your civilian listeners <laughs> so going out in the field. So no, I think you, you have to be smart enough yourself. And then also to make sure your people that are really pushing themselves hard also are taking, and, and you educate them on that too, yeah. right? Help them understand you've got to take that rest so that you can go harder next time. Right. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you have to second, like, like my second appointment, something like really bad happened the first day we got there. Yeah. So five days, nothing to sleep, right? It was like something really bad. Right. So it's five days. Like we could attack that and max and stuff. Like, like, yeah, we knew we couldn't sleep, right? Because it's like really some bad stuff, right? But right. then it, it was over, and like, like we slept like two straight days, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, exactly. And then you probably needed really another two weeks yeah. to kind of recover, right? Uh, yeah. So, so making sure leaders are educated on that, they can make sure that their people are taken care of, and they can take care of themselves so that they can continue to lead. That's really important. So your company, it's it's the grit factor. Is that is that like the 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 coaching thing, the speaking thing, the books, or is it all combined? the great, the great Institute is everything. everything exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and in an ideal world, an ideal engagement with a customer or a client might be, Hey, I'll, I'll give the keynote to your, you know, 500 or a thousand people or, or, you know, 100. So, like a big funnel, so to speak, or lead, lead magic, so to speak. I, yeah. I mean, I guess, I don't know that it's a magnet cause you're, it's a paid service, mm-hmm. but it is, um, it is the initial engagement is is oftentimes a keynote uh, with along with the book purchase, which makes it a better event for them because then there's a takeaway and there's a way to go deeper. And then ideally, we then move into training um, that says, okay, let's take this training now, either going for grit or paths to purpose into your company for the next six weeks. And that's really where you transform culture is when you really make that commitment, you align some of the language that you use, you align, I mean, in, in a longer term engagement, you could align other elements of culture as well. But, um, but the keynote and the book are kind of still primary for me. And then, then the training as well is, is something that we're really building into because that's where the transformation happens. So do you ever say, you know, if I want to hire me as a speaker, you got to, you have to do the training or do you, or do you say, no. or do you say, Hey, uh, my speaking fee is X amount, but I'll lower it to this amount. If you sign up for the coaching, you know, we haven't come up with that, but that is something that could happen is, is more of a bundle sort of an offer sometimes. Yeah. It just depends. And that, that, that's up to a negotiation with every client and, and where they are and what their needs are. So yeah. From your point of view, who's your perfect customer? My perfect customer. Gosh, I've had, I feel like all my customers are great customers. Um, great clients. Uh, they're people that are dedicated to transforming culture. They're dedicated to making a change and being successful and understanding that grit and resilience is part of that journey for them. That purpose is part of that journey for both them as leaders, as well as for their people. And they're willing to make an investment in their people. That's the key is a client willing to invest in their people, which is what they do when they bring me into keynote, which is what they do when they, they offer the books out, which is what they do when they offer the training to their people. That's investing in your people for the long run. And it's, you know, the statistics on this, cause you're in HR, but the statistics are pretty clear that the younger generation expects employers to invest in them. And so this is an opportunity to really take the best of leadership and management and grit and resilience and mindset and purpose and story and say, we're going to offer this to our people in a way that really shows that we're investing in them and in a way that can transform our culture for the better in the long run. So that's the ideal client is someone willing to invest in their people. So how do you solve this? Because like, of course, this generation, I want to be like trained by the, by the company, right? Yes. I think a lot of companies on the mindset, if I hire you, you need to be able to work with day one, right? Ah, so I think there's a conflict there, right? How do you fix that? Or is that possible? In this case, uh, (laughs) um, again, it's a balance, right? It's a balance, but I think the client or the the company has to understand that they're, they must train people. They must invest in their people for them to do good work. And, and so I would, would push back on a company that thinks they need to just start off 
you know, running at day one, nobody starts off running at day one. I mean, that's why you have the book, the first 90 days, right? As a leader, it's, it takes you, you know, 90 to 120 to 180 days to kind of understand what the heck is going on. And you've got to invest in your people and train them well in order for them to be connected in with the company mission and the company purpose and to be engaged as an engaged employee and to be sure that they are, they know how to perform and how to contribute in their best possible selves. And, uh, and that's the only way that it works for both people. So. I remember this saying, quest problem linked there. I, I probably get this wrong, but somebody said uh the CFO told the CEO, hey, Jason's gonna leave us to give him a raise. No, no, was no, no, was Jay, we need to put invest money in Jason for training, right? And the guy was like, Well, what if you invest money in Jason and he leaves for someone else? And the CFO was like, What if he don't, he stays? Yes, you know? exactly. No, that's a great, that is great. The other part of that is. Well, if he leaves right away after you've trained him, maybe you you should know uh, know enough about Jason and what he wants and how he wants to contribute to be able to connect him to that purpose. The other the inter other interesting stats are people don't stay longer because they're paid more and have bigger bonuses, right? There's really interesting yeah. stats on that. They stay longer and they perform better when they're connected to purpose. Yeah. And so if you are doing your work to connect with your people and care for your people and develop them because you actually care for them, they're going to stick around. I mean, maybe one in, once once in a while they don't, but um, that's the other part of it is that's a leadership failure, right? If your people are leaving constantly, that's a leadership failure. That That's on you. Uh, so you've got to know. Know who it is that you're hiring. Make sure your hiring process is tight, but also make sure that you are investing in your people and connecting with them regularly enough that they know that they're being invested in, that they know that you care for them. And if you do that work, I, I mean, that that's what it's about. What makes yeah. you say no to a potential client? I haven't said no to it unless somebody asked me to speak for free, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, this is such a great cause. Uh, you should just come down here. I was like, time away from my family. You can't tell me that that's worth time away from my family. You know, I, and, and I do, we, we give back significantly in our community and financially and with our time. So that is something that we do, but we make those choices ourselves. We don't wait for that to approach us. Um, so I will also explain that, that we have our own philanthropic priorities. Uh, but otherwise, I, I mean, I, you know, I have a fee and, um, and I'm happy to, to speak to anybody that is willing to invest in their people. And I do think of that as not, do I necessarily have a strong personal cohesion with their particular company's mission necessarily, but if they're investing in their people, I care about people and, and people's connection to purpose, because I believe that makes us all better people. And that makes us show up better and do better things in the world. And if I can be part of that, that's awesome. How about this company's values don't match yours? Like supposed are like, of course, a bad, bad example. Opposed are like, you know, like we don't believe females be flying Apaches, right? Yeah. That's yeah. Well, I've right. spoken to many people who believe that. Yeah. I, I don't mind. I mean, I think again, I think by getting out there, putting yourself out and sharing the story, sharing the lessons learned, I think number one, some people have come around probably as a result of that. And, and number two, there's a chance to impact people positively. And if I have that opportunity, that's fantastic. And again, I think we also do need to be out there in the world with people we don't agree with as well. And yeah. so I, I don't care if I agree or not, as long as we agree that you want to invest in your people and I want to help you with your investment in your people. That's awesome. I nice, think that's great. Nice. Yeah. So back to your villas in France, how did you and your family contribute to the to that society in France? Like how, what, what, what did y'all do for those people? So to speak? thank you for asking that because the reality is, is that we felt uncomfortable that we did not contribute much in that way. Right. We were just there. Right. I mean, we contributed because we were part of the economy, you know, and we certainly went out to eat and we bought things in the economy. Um, but it was hard to know how we could do anything there because, and for us, that was a point of, Humility and um, humility, I think, is is the right way to describe it. It wasn't shame because there was no. I wasn't for lack of being aware or trying, but um, it was just uh, a, a humility that there wasn't much we could do there. Like in our community here, we are very, very, very involved, and over there, we were kind of reliant on the generosity of others, and that was hard. And and an important lesson in kind of vulnerability, and I think, and in humility for all of us. Well, in France, did you ever come back to the States to visit or you were there for the whole year? We were there for the whole year. Well, I, I came back to the States to work. So I did keynotes uh, in Portugal, in Florida, in South Carolina. So I came back and did some keynotes on the East Coast um, and then did a bunch of virtual stuff. But I was never back home in Washington. Yeah. In France, was there anything that you missed about Washington State or the United States? Um, they were like, like I, mean, I, I miss this, whatever it is. I missed our community. Uh, we have a wonderful community in, in North Central Washington where we live. And uh, we have a 
um, a wonderful church there that we love and love the people there. Um, so I miss that a lot. Um, but it was a very similar town in some regards, like it was a mountain town. We live in a mountain town. We lived in a mountain town in France. So there were some similarities there that were, were really nice, but um, yeah, that's probably about and it. How long have y'all been back? We've been back for about a month. Oh, just a month? Yeah. So yeah, what are yeah. things you miss about France already? We miss the village culture most of all. I miss some people a lot. There are a number of people that we met that we love deeply and we'll go back and visit. And um, uh, certainly miss really good cheese because there's really good cheese. Uh, and um, and the village culture is different than like the city culture here or the small town culture, even where we live, because you you just walk into town and get a coffee and then you stop by and pick up something for lunch. Or, and, you know, our grocery bills were like 40% less than they were in the U.S. So it was a lot less expensive, even though we stopped by the store all the time. Um, great, great bread, great cheese, great wine. Um, and just this sense of like, you know, the church bells, I love the village bells in European villages and, um, and this sense of this little, this little community, it was just lovely. The village culture was, was really wonderful. I don't think people yeah. who never left the United States don't realize how much different, better the food is in overseas, right? It's so much better. And, 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 it's, and, so and, much. and it's not even close. Like, like you go overseas, you taste the great food, you come back, you, you, just, you just taste the processed stuff here, right? Yeah, exactly. It is so good. So fresh. And all the food is like that, right? It is. Care. Europe, Italy, France, oh, Italy is Thailand, like better. Yeah, whatever, yeah. You know, it's like you just you man, this is like how come our food can't be like this in America? It's food, right? It's real food. It's not processed. Yeah, the processed stuff. I just um, luckily the place where we live also in North Central Washington, I think, is really big on the farm to table type mm -hmm. thing and lots of co-op type stuff and fresh food and uh, but and, and the mountain food in France is actually not the best, right? It's like lots of cheese and potatoes, which mm -hmm. I but um, but some of the cheese is so good. So good. <laughs> so, and so you're, you're, you're a big wine drinker? Not a big wine drinker. Okay. I'm not, not, I, I feel like also over 50, right? Like mm. it's just harder, right? Yeah. Um, but French wine didn't give me a headache, like okay. in the same way as wine from here does, but I enjoy wine. Yeah, okay. I enjoy wine. Yeah. Nice. Um, so next, you're talking about your company, some, but can you go like more details, like how you started, what you're doing? What you focus on now, what your big vision is for it? Yeah, for, for the Grit yeah. the Institute. Yeah, the great, the big work with the Grit Institute right now is really to deploy this training a lot more widely. It's I know it's impactful and I know it's incredible. And it's it's fun to have a chance too to be able to be at Tuck a couple times a year uh, at the business school working uh, in, in that material. So you can kind of see what resonates, what doesn't resonate, what can I tweak, what can I change? And um, and so kind of have this constant evolution of that material. I'm also working working on the next book and then blowing out the training is really the thing and uh and that's the work yeah that's the work at home you know we're going to start a boy scout troop and and keep keep try to keep up with the boys but um but work it's really it's really increasing the training so that that is the primary revenue source within the grit institute and that's my goal and so it's yeah. plan like like you plan on scaling this you have you plan like have like little like like franchise over across the united states for like you like bring on different cultures and you train on how to do your model and that, you know, possibly John Maxwell model, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's possible that that is not in the current plan, although it's possible. I do have affiliates that are working with me on deploying some of the training. There's a training that I worked on. Um, so going for grit is one of the two trainings It's six weeks. It's, um, uh, six weeks, video supported, workbook supported. And, uh, and it's probably, you know, you give yourself 20 to 30 minutes a day. It follows the grit factor. Essentially the second training is paths to purpose. And that we've already talked about paths to purpose. So those are the two six week training modules. And then this last year I developed at the request of now a partner called Scholastics. I developed a going for grit program for middle school and high schoolers. And I'm so incredibly excited about it. And it has a facilitator's guide with it. So that's intended to be in person 45 to 50 minutes a day, um, either as an after school program or part of a leadership program. And that facilitator's guide means that anybody, like I can give that to you, Jason, and say, Jason, you've got five minutes. You're going to go teach this cohort. And then you can walk in and teach that cohort. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions going through the day. And it's awesome. I, I, it, I, I thought it was going to be a, a, a kind of a light lift. I was like, I've got going for grit. I'll just kind of, you know, put it into a different format. It was a much heavier lift because I, I have kids that age. Like I know what they need to do. They need communication skills. They need active listening skills. We need to really build in like conflict resolution skills. So how do we build that into this curricula and it's it's just awesome. So I'm talking to a school right now about um, putting that into practice, both the adult version for their faculty and then this other version for the uh, middle school and high schoolers. And um, 
Scholastics is also pitching it to both after school programs as well as other school districts. And I'm super excited for that because kids need this more than they've ever needed it before. So this facilitator, even though you like pretty much like give them the, the, the plan, right? Yeah. How, how do you like vet them, make sure they can actually do this for you, right? It, it's up to them to make it work in the in the case but of the schools. Don't make yeah. it look bad. They fail at it, you know. What I'm it's saying? a great like, question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So you're, you're signed on to them, right? So to speak, right? Yeah. Or they totally mess it up and like and yeah, to your company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, that hasn't been because this is new. I I don't anticipate it being a problem, but you're right. That is a risk that it could be diluted in some way that way. Uh, I think that um, the schools will have an invested. In, uh, they'll be invested in making sure that it's a success, and so hopefully they are also looking at this. They're choosing the facilitator appropriately, although it's it's again built for any anybody to be able to do it, and assuming a lower skilled facilitator. Uh, but um, but you're right. That that is a risk. That's a risk in the business, and and. Um, that would argue for the potential for some training of coaches as well to be able to do this. The, the programs that are online are set up to be able to be run autonomously. So you could sign up for one and take one by yourself. Um, or a company could say, I want to take a cohort through, and then you'll have your own cohort kind of online platform to be able to chat and talk and, and interact back and forth. Um, and it can be run at the company level, or I can be brought in for kind of a higher touch option to be able to do a kickoff webinar and maybe like a closing webinar as well. So I think yeah. both programs like six weeks. Why six weeks? Just like is that is that like six weeks, four hours a day, three hours a day, or something? Like... No, it's like twenty to thirty minutes a day. I mean, you okay. can put in more time if you wanted okay. to, but um, and there's some suggestions for that if you wanted to put in more time. But no, it's meant that it's expecting that you're a working professional and that you're you are investing in yourself or you're a company that's investing in people who are working and saying, hey, we want to give you additional skills, additional capabilities, additional tools to be able to go further, and uh, and so that is that's the assumption that's that we made when we developed the training. Can you give us any tips you have on how to become a better public speaker oh yeah uh <laughs> there's lots and lots lots of practice lots and lots of practice it is good to work with a coach sometimes i worked with a great lady named connie miller who's from seattle she's fabulous um you can work with friends as well there are various speaking agencies that will help you work on your your public speaking i would also say do the comparable work which is to go look at other people who do a really good job look and um, try to find examples of their speeches and watch them and analyze them and say okay now how might how do I want to incorporate this into the work that I do? Um, is there a way that, that, that this feels either natural or or maybe this is one way I might work at it. This is another way. I might... So it's looking at comparables really. Uh, and then it's just kind of doing some research and then it's playing with it and practicing and practicing and practicing. You cannot practice enough. So how do you do your schedule? Like all this stuff going on, like you have a schedule, like, you know, like on like, like, like Fridays is this family or Thursdays is this, this, or do you just wake up every day? Like, or lack of a better tune, just wing it every day. Yeah, okay. no, no. It's um. So I keep my meetings primarily between Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you have a count other than you who offered me a Saturday, <laughs> uh, but otherwise, if you called and wanted a meeting or you email and, and want a meeting, and there's a, I will give you a block between Tuesday and Thursday, usually in the afternoons. Um, that doesn't always work for East Coast clients or other you know, overseas clients, and then we'll just be a lot more flexible. But generally speaking, it's in the afternoons, Tuesdays through Thursdays. And that allows me to do more creative work in the mornings. Uh, and um, and that's the writing work and, and the other work. And then the, where I don't have calls, then that's where I can do administrative work and do my emails and, you know, do a little bit of social. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be more strategic on social now, so I don't have to be on it as much, but it's also great, like, especially LinkedIn, right, is a great place to engage. Uh, so, so that's how I, think about it somewhat broadly. And, um, and I aspire to being a little bit more blocky in my schedules. So this is exactly when I do this. And, but, but the reality is, again, I've got kids, one of them is homeschooling this year. It's, it, you ha I have to be a bit more flexible. So, yes. yeah. So how do you do this? Like when you do your, your coaching, mm -hmm. how, what, what's, well, backpack. what's your advice for someone who wants to get a coach? Like how do they find the best coach for them? I think ask around, honestly, ask around, um, get people's feedback on what experiences, you know, which, which coach has worked for them and then be specific on, um, because we all have a tendency to rationalize our own choices. So if I have a coach, I'm going to rationalize the fact that I 
you know, and paying lots of money for this coach. So ask, have some specific questions. Think in advance about what do I want to get out of this coaching relationship? What would make a successful coaching relationship from my perspective? And then as you're interviewing people about either their coaching or others about their coaches, then ask those very specific questions and see what you can kind of tease out, but get specific instead of general about what it is that you want to get out of it. And then have an honest conversation with the coach once you get to that place and interview that coach and say, hey, this is this is what I'm looking for. How do you work? And, and make sure that it's a good fit because it ne won't necessarily always be a good fit. And that's an important, and that's okay, right? Any decent coach, any decent professional is going to be able to say, it's okay if it's not a perfect fit. We'll, um, you know, find find somebody that is, so. Can you talk about the points of having mentors and talk about either some of your mentors from the past or maybe any mentors you might have right now? Mentorship is a place that... I think it's really important. I hear that it's really important. The studies are, are that it's really important. I haven't had a mentor in the formal way that we talk about mentorship. And I, I sort of regret that. Um, I have had people mentor me and I'm grateful for that in uh, all along the way, right? In different, different, different positions from the military to corporate and beyond. And, and even today, I, I actually have thought recently that I would like to look more formally for somebody who might be a more strategic mentor. Um, but just to, to the mentorship in general, it's certainly all of the studies are really clear that it's it's pretty important for success for most people. And that, uh, for example, the women who stayed in the military and performed at very high levels all will credit mentors for part of their success. And so I think that is both mentorship and ultimately sponsorship within the context of larger organizations is really, really important. And we do talk about this in The Grit Factor. I had a chance to interview Marsh Clark, who is a two-time Purple Heart winner from Vietnam and is the mentor to Don Dunlop, who is a two-star general in the Air Force, flew everything in the inventory. And they had a, a wonderful mentoring relationship. And, and that's a they'll, they'll speak to the importance of chemistry in that relationship as well. So so I guess it's still something that's aspirational for me, but I definitely did the research on it, and it's it's clearly worthwhile if you can if you can make it work. Now, are you mentoring anyone yourself? I am not right now. I have, have had mentoring uh, conversations with people when they've reached out, a well, young woman from Dartmouth, and actually the grit factor started because a young woman reached out and said, "Would I mentor her as she began the same journey that I had taken a number of years before?" And um, and then I said yes, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" But I just have this one experience. How can I scale what I offer to her? And if I do that work, scale the people to whom it's offered, and that was the genesis of what became the grit factor. So grit yeah. is this someone like you're basically born with? Or can you be taught grit or like, you no, know, but I guess the basic, you know, yeah. born leader, learn leader, is grit the same way? Or like I think, I think it's both and it's, I think so many things in life are both and. So I, I do always say, and I always start, well, I usually start a keynote by saying, you know, a grit is not just for military pilots and big mountain climbers and Ironman triathletes, right? Grit is something that is innate to every single one of us. I do believe that. Um, you have to find it. It has to be prompted for some of us. And sometimes we have to go back and build it, or we, we need to take advantage of opportunities where it can be built. And so it's really a both and thing. I think it's uh, there, there's always opportunities to be better. And, uh, and we do have it inside of uh, ourselves somewhere, even when we can't always see it. And for coming, I know you're like, you deal with any industry, but have you found like a certain industry, certain size revenue come to a certain like specific demographic? like resonates with your, what you're doing more than others? Not really. I mean, I think, uh, that that would that would be great actually because I could target <laughs> and reach out to them more more easily right um I I have I've spoken with a lot of pharmaceutical companies so I think that has been a place that it resonates um often I mean I will often speak to women's groups within mostly male companies uh, or veterans groups within larger companies larger tech companies technology is another place that it really resonates um there's such a quick you know, pace of change. There's often challenges of bringing minorities into leadership roles, that sort of thing, um, especially women. And um, yeah, I mean, honestly, it, it seriously does apply to, to every industry. I think places that really resonate with military stories in particular can also be kind of more old school industries like packaging companies or kind of more industrial and construction and that sort of thing. Um, but honestly, it it really just it 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 really is across industries and across sectors, and I'm grateful for that because I love I love the variety of that. Yes. So, um, for, for your company, and you know you talk about potentially scaling in the future, right? Yeah. How do you know it's time to scale? Like, how do you know it's time to like you know like put the fuel on the fire, so to speak? 
I think when you're maxed out as, as a, as a single person, right. You're maxed out. Like I know that because of what I want to be able to, to manage in the rest of my life, I'm not going to travel more than twice a month. So I'm not scalable, right? I'm a single person. And that was actually the impetus to start to develop these courses to say, how do I offer this to a much larger group of people, knowing that I can only travel at a certain fee twice a month. And, and these courses are available for a fraction of that and, and go even deeper into that. So if I can scale that, then that's actually the purpose of of enabling success in other people so that we can all contribute our best to the world, right? It's building courageous leaders for a better world. That's the mission of the Grid Institute. And, and in order to do that, how do I scale that? Well, I can do things online. I can make, make training available online. I can write the books where more people can read these things and be able to go forward. So I think it's when you realize that you are maxed out on what you can do, uh, it's time to scale and make sure that that mission can be met in other ways. So do you see yeah. yourself increasing your travel time once your kids are out of the house? No, no, because I still want to write. Okay. I mean, the writing and the research, um, the the creation part of, of the work is really important to me. Again, it's what I didn't feel like I had in the military um, and I need that time. So I know I, I don't, I won't travel more than that. Okay. that that's going to be it. That's like a, what's the word? Red line in the sand, so to speak. It's not, yeah. I mean, I would also say like, you know, August, you often don't travel, yeah. right? December, maybe like the early part of the month, but not usually later. So so maybe there's three engagements in November and there's one in December okay. or something. So it ends up averaging out to that, yeah. So how good opportunity would have to be for you to like go over this? Like, like so when somebody say like, I want you to come speak at all the VPs of IBM for a $500 fee or like-, like Oh, I would do that. Yeah, yeah I would do that. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think you're always balancing, um, not because I'm willing to, I, I don't think that that violates a value that just says, okay, how do we manage like both the, the business requirements yeah. that are, are, that I need to produce for our family. And you don't want to pass a business opportunity because you have this like strict guideline. No, 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 no. Right. Right. But at the same time, there are speakers who want to be on the road 300 days a year. And that's not me. That's, insane. Yeah, that's yeah. not me. I mean, and maybe they, they love it and that's awesome, but that's not who I'm going to be. So I'm going to be, um, more, more, uh, careful. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything that I sort of asked you that I didn't know anything else you want to talk about? Oh boy. We did pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Nice job. Thanks. Yeah. Seriously. Thanks. <laughs> no, I don't think so. This has been fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Sure. Yeah. I'm at shannonpolson.com, S H A N N O N P O L S O N.com. Also at the grit institute.com on LinkedIn at Shannon H. Polson. Um, Instagram at Shannon H. Polson and, uh, and on YouTube at the Grit Institute. So I'd love to see you on any or all of those. Please subscribe to this uh, Facing the Wind at Substack and um, subscribe on all of the social channels. And I'd love to interact with you and hear what you have to say. Shannon, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. I loved our conversation. And so listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.